All right, everyone. We're going to try to get started in a minute here. All right, my name is uh, Brad Weibel. I'm an associate professor at Penn State University in the psychology department, and I'll be chairing this session. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce four wonderful speakers who are going to be talking about uh, spatial aspects of um, of brain and mind function. While we're still getting seated, uh, the organizers uh, gave me permission to briefly plug the Neuromatch Academy, uh, which will be teaching courses on computational neuroscience and deep learning. Um, so whether you're an undergraduate or out through a faculty member uh, or work in the industry, uh, we have the options of learning virtually through this platform. Uh, so we'll have applications going live in about a week for both students and also paid TAs. So if you're interested, just Google Neuromatch Academy and you'll find it. All right, so it's my great pleasure to introduce a longtime colleague of mine, Andre Fenton, who is a professor of neural science at New York University. Um, he's an incredibly uh, diverse kind of scientist. He does a lot of different kinds of things, all the way from molecular mechanisms of uh, plasticity in the hippocampus to single unit work to EEG and also theory, why he's such a great uh, match for cosine. So Andre is one of those rare scientists who really instills his value into the work that he does. So he's done a lot of uh, things for the, for the world in general. So for example, he's um, built and created a wireless intracranial EEG uh, platform for rodents, uh, which he distributes now through a company. But also, during the onset of the pandemic, Andre realized that there was going to be a shortage of ventilators. And what he did was applied his engineering expertise to the problem of creating a relatively affordable ventilator for countries, like including ours, that was having a shortage. And so he found a way to repurpose com consumer grade CPAP machines. Um, for this purpose, and now those are being widely used in Nigeria as well as an increasing number of other places. So um, what Andre is going to tell us about today is a reframing of our notion of hippocampal remapping. And this is a really uh, crucial way of changing our understanding of how the hippocampus remaps to novel environments. And what's really interesting about this is that it's coming not from someone who's outside the field giving us a new perspective, but from someone who's been in the field for 30 years. So he really knows his stuff, and he's going to be changing some of the ways that we think about remapping. Andre, please. Thank you for that very kind um, uh, introduction. And I'm going to take you on, on a little bit of a journey. Um, and I really want to thank the um, the organizers for, you know, for inviting me here. I'm very grateful. It is actually amazing to look out and see how many uh, people, live people, are, are here to communicate with. And this is actually my first cosine. I always have something that conflicts with this, so that's a good thing about the pandemic. It got rid of that conflict, and um, I think I'll uh, uh, persist uh, uh, with that going forward. So the basic question that I hope to address, and, and by the end of this uh, lecture, I hope to either uh, clarify the answer to this, what is the nature of the hippocampus um, uh, knowledge system, either clarify or confuse what you already know. Either outcome will be very good, and is my purpose. So this story really starts, and I, uh, in preparing the lecture, I was able to think this started sometime in late January in 1991, when by a series of, of mistakes, frankly, I ended up in the uh, Academy of Sciences in the Czech Republic in Prague in Jan Burish's uh, a laboratory. I'd gotten to Prague because I'd just finished my undergraduate degree in biology um, with a, um, a, a minor in um, a philosophy, and I accordingly had no skills. Uh, but I went to Prague 
because it was interesting. A revolution had just uh, uh, happened, and it was also inexpensive to live. Having no skills, that's a, uh, a plus. And one day, and I really remember this, you know, Jan said, look, you, maybe you should do work in the hippocampus. He studied all different parts of the brain. And I said, so, you know, why the hippocampus? And he said, well, there are neurons in the hippocampus that respond to places. And that freaked me out. The reason it freaked me out is because I remembered some of the philosophy I'd had that there really was no such thing as a place, at least according to Kant. And it was the kind of thing that a brain generated. And you'll see, um, you know, Jan in his wisdom said, I said, is it true? And he said, well, I don't know, read uh, this book. And he had me read this book. And, um, you know, this is O'Keefe and Nadell, early in the book, they say, and I'll quote, we shall argue that the hippocampus is the core of a neural memory system, providing an objective spatial framework within which the items and events of an organism's experience are located and interrelated. And that totally resonated with me from Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. You can read the quotes here. In fact, it's, it's even worth doing. Space is a necessary a priori, that's before experience, representation that underlies all outer intuitions. One can never forge a representation of the absence of space, though one can quite well think that no things are to be met within it. Kant was arguing, and this you know, changed how uh, philosophy, um, at least Western philosophy, executed over time, that you know, all experience is understood through a subjective framework of space and time, and that brains, or minds in his words, generate. Okay? They don't sense them. So cut to 2014. And the Nobel Prize, John O'Keefe shares the Nobel Prize with the Mosers for, for their discoveries of cells that constitute a positioning system in the brain. And what John observed was this. I hope this will play. Can you hear this? Can you hear the action potentials from this? Great. So I recorded this in about 1996 as a graduate student. It's the place cell phenomena. This rat's walking around. We're listening to the amplified action potentials of a single CA1 neuron somewhere in this part of the uh, hippocampus. And wherever the animal is, when that cell discharges, we draw a red dot. And that, in some sense, describes the tuning function. And John O'Keefe's intuition, and I should just point out, other people had observed these cells too, but wouldn't recognize that they coded for place because that was not something one would expect. One would not have expected a cognitive system in a rodent. Um, and so here, for example, are 10 cells. Um, some cells don't fire at all in this environment. And John's intuition was if you put the firing fields together, if you put the tuning curves together, you could figure out where the animal was. And this made a map of the world. So it turns out that. You know, for us to understand the nature of the hippocampal knowledge system, it really is important for us to figure out what it means when a place cell discharges. So that's a fairly straightforward, you'd imagine, experimental uh, uh, program. But I want to pause for a moment. You'll see this is relevant. Okay. What is the nature of a clock? Okay. Think about that for a moment. I'm going to show you my favorite clock. This is the clock in um, Old Town Square in Prague. It's a, an astronomical clock. It measures time. But in many ways, clocks also model time. They are our model for what time will be. This clock, by the way, um, uh, tracks all of the uh, celestial bodies, or several celestial bodies, including the moon. And it's a sidereal clock. It, wor it works on figuring out where the moon is in the heavens and not according to the phases of the moon, like most lunar uh, uh, calendars or clocks. And I want to show you something that fascinated me in the pandemic. I was paying a lot of attention to how people showed up at the um, uh, emergency rooms and such. And there's a strong periodicity in almost all the data that you can look at around um, infectious rates or, or uh, hospitalization rates. And that periodicity is a week. And that's because we have a model of time that constitutes a week. And we have two days off on the weekends. And those are the, uh, 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 the low uh, uh, periods here. This is not in the biology 
It's in the model of time that we use as a, as a society, as a culture, and it has consequences in how we interpret and observe things in the world. And that's a theme I'm going to come back to. So let's get back to it. What's the nature of the hippocampus knowledge system? So a really crucial phenomena um, that John Kuby and Bob Muller identified early in, uh, in the uh, 80s was, is hippocampal remapping. And I got this uh, figure from, from John. They didn't even have a printer that could print it out on a, on a large enough page um, of an early cell that they recorded in four different uh, environments. And each environment had this white card. I'm shown out here as a black arc. And cell one fired um, here in the cylinder and in a different place relative to the card in the box and not in these other two boxes. This is an example that they published where the cell fires in different places with respect to the card, with respect to the environment in the four environments. And they called this uh, remapping. The organization of the hippocampus uh, 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 tuning curves would change, and they had some inferences from that. Here's another example of the kinds of experiments that they did. Here, they put the uh, animal into the uh, environment with the cue in place. Then they took the animal out and they move the cue, in this case, 90 degrees, and you can see this cell follows the cue. We call this cue control. This cell, cell is always discharging somewhere around the uh, counter, uh, the, the uh, clockwise edge of the card. Here's another example um, from an, uh, a different paper. Here they put the animal in the arena uh, one time, and notice this cell fires across from the card. Then they move the card in small steps, 45 degree steps, in the presence of the, mount, of the rat, and the card, the, the cell follows the card. And you can see now um, the card is still opposite the card. Here's another example where in the same uh, step, instead of moving it 45 degrees, they move the card 180 degrees, and the cell ignores it. Okay? The same cell, however, is going to be controlled by this card every time they move it 45 degrees, all done in the presence of the animal. And so this was at least to me, fascinating. I was in the lab when these experiments were done, and I couldn't really uh, fathom how, how the cells could sometimes decide and sometimes not decide to follow these stimuli. A key intuition and an inference that was made, and, and here, the, this is an early recording of two cells at the same time. It was very difficult at the time to record two cells, Kubi tells me, and so they dreamed of this experiment. And what they imagined is if they recorded two cells that happened to have overlapping firing fields, that those two cells would co-fire together on some short time scale. Here the time scale, notice, is about five seconds. And if they moved the animal to another environment, a different shaped environment, and there would be a remapping, now the cells are firing, but they don't have coincident firing fields, their tuning curves are different, and they will not fire together. And this intuition suggested to, to Bob and and John into the field that this idea of remapping was a reorganization of the temporal activity of the cells, but you could actually study it by looking at the tuning curves from the uh, cells. So I get to the lab um, from, from uh, uh, Prague, and um, at the, in the beginning, I'm you know, fascinated by these tuning curves, and I, at the time, we recorded one or two cells at a time, and so I could pay attention to what the cell did. And here's an example of something that fascinated and, and bothered me and annoyed Bob, um, which is when the rat walked across the firing field on this occasion and this occasion, they're separated by about 30 seconds or so, and these two paths are almost are more than 90% uh, uh, identical at 3 uh, centimeter and 16 millisecond time resolutions. And on this occasion, the cell fired a lot of spikes, and on this occasion, no spikes. Nothing had changed. And so we could demonstrate that this was very surprising. If you computed an expectation, you'd expect about 20, 19 spikes on this occasion. Uh, or you observed 19 spikes on this occasion. You expected about nine. Similarly here, and we observed zero. We called this over dispersion. And so that was one of the, the ideas or, or facts that sort of lodged in my mind. What kind of lousy hippocampal system this would make if you needed cells like this, totally unreliable, in order to get around? And this is very characteristic. Almost all, all uh, cells do this. 
Another uh, annoying or, or puzzling uh, observation was this. If we recorded these cells in the standard uh, cylinder, about 76 centimeters in diameter, or in this case, a somewhat larger room, it's not that large, it's a, a meter and a half by 1.4 meters, we can record place cells. Um, here are nine of them shown, where their tuning curves look approximately similar across the span of an hour. In, in the intervening one hour, though, the animal was in that box. These were very familiar environments, and what you can see is that now the fields have two more, two, three places in which they fire. Take cell four. If cell four were to fire, what would your intuition be? Where would you guess the animal uh, to be? You'd be wrong if you took any kind of average across the uh, uh, two locations, and you'd have to just sort of guess. But this is trivial to figure out where the animal is if you consider an across cell or population uh, level code and ensemble code. And you can think about uh, place cells as each signaling in, in some uh, verifiable way, um, some location in space, or you could think of them as being part of an ensemble, part of a pattern of activity where no particular cell is important for that, for uh, what that signal might be, what the message is here, uh, game over. Some would be on, some would be off, and, and as long as you had a reliable such pattern, you could decode this and everyone would be happy. When we looked, and here's an example of, we started recording lots more cells, so we could get many examples here. Here are three cells recorded. It happened to be during a place avoidance task, but that's not important. And you can see that cell A and B, although their firing fields are very similar, they don't like to fire together at um, the same time. Um, whereas cell B and C, this one and this one, they're also overlapping, they do like to fire together. And cell A and C happen to have a temporal offset of about 70 milliseconds, and this happens to be characteristic. So where does that leave our, our, our intuition on the, that the idea of remapping was uh, uh, based upon? So I'm gonna switch to an experiment that we, we've recently done. Um, you can see a lot of this experiment in the bioarchive. I'll be updating it in uh, uh, two days as we finish the revision. Um, and here we're going to use uh, mini microscopes and calcium imaging to record across uh, three weeks um, in a classic remapping experiment, putting the animal in a cylinder and um, in, in a box. And the first thing to note, as others have noted, is that when you record cells in an unbiased way, about 20 or so percent of them turn out to have properties that you could classify as being play cells. This proportion goes up with experience, so it's about 25%. And if, as you've seen um, earlier today or earlier in the, um, in the meeting, if you plot the activity here, we've linearized the activity as, a, as an angle in one of these environments. If you organize the cells according to where they fire the most, you can get a very nice uh, position representation. I want to point out here that these recordings are five minutes apart. And in the next 10 minutes, uh, the, the, the recording pattern that you see in the box doesn't uh, reappear. However, if, and, and you can't find that again uh, across the three weeks, but if you align these activities after the animal has experience, you can see that pattern, and it persists now 10, uh, across the 10 minutes. In fact, it persists for weeks. And so this happens to be a learned pattern, and these, uh, this is what you can do when you plot the activity of the 20% of cells that happen to be uh, play cells. If you ask, however, how does this co-firing uh, um, uh, correspond to the similarity between pairs of uh, place cells, you can see there's a significant correlation. It's slightly uh, better, not even statistically better than if you look at all the cells that are non-place cells, but it explains very little. And we'll come back to that. So I haven't been exhausted, but there are a number of assumptions upon which the hippocampal place code and remapping in particular um, have not been supported by our observations. And, you know, I, just like everyone else, wave my hands and say, well, you know, that wasn't really an important uh, assumption anyway, and, and we carry on. So let me tell you what we think about um, when we think about remapping today. And this is motivated by uh, uh, people who have not spent a lot of time in the field, and uh, Elliot in particular, who's moved on, always said when he was uh, a graduate, so you really think that? You really think that? And so that was uh, terribly annoying, but also very instructive. <laughs> so there are really two schools of, uh, of spatial coding to, to think about. 
Um, you can think of the place field code, if you will, that the place field is important and, and, and such, or this ensemble uh, uh, coding uh, 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 point of view, where the patterns of activity across the cells, how cells co-fire in, uh, in time, in particular, not so much in space, as I'll argue in a moment, turns out to be important. And I, I will be um, uh, supporting that in a moment. And so you can think about the remapping hypothesis, the standard uh, view sort of uh, along these lines, that there are a bunch of environmental inputs onto cells, they fall randomly and such, and that <clears throat> um, in a different environment, those environmental in inputs are different and the cells uh, fire because of the uh, differences in their excitation and inhibition uh, uh, profiles. And this cartoon is, is what we currently think, uh, what I'm gonna argue for with the rest of the talk, in this re-registration hy hypothesis, which as a graduate student, I would propose just to be annoying to, uh, uh, in particular, John Kuby, but it goes something like this. You could imagine um, that there's a representation, it has some form, here's a solid cylinder, and depending on how you look at that, the projection, it can look like a rectangle or it could look like a, uh, a circle. And it's, the object itself hasn't changed. What has changed is how it's registered to the environment, the projection that we'll use to, uh, to actually observe it. And it, cartooned in this way, what you can imagine is that the environment has some control over the, re the re registration of this more or less intact uh, uh, network of activity that on its own is quite happy to fire in whatever uh, temporally organized ways it wants to. And I'll make the case uh, for that. So something that really uh, got me convinced was we were studying synaptic plasticity and Claudia Joe in the lab had trained animals in this place avoidance task which is a task we use in the lab uh, commonly. Um, animals remember it for a long time. They simply have to not, whoa, they simply have to not um, enter this uh, area that's marked red for us. It's not marked for the animals. They learn it quickly. And here we used a trap mouse uh, driven by the ARC promoter to mark the cells that the animals um, presumably activated with this immediate early gene after they remembered, uh, uh, after day two, they remembered where to avoid. And we could come back uh, 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 up to a month later or months later and find those cells. And these cells had been tagged actually with uh, channel rhodopsin. And so Claudia came back and two weeks later and then a month later she would activate these cells and we were shocked, I was at least shocked, that the animals would actually avoid. And one day I said, well, you know, why don't we just put the animal in a completely new environment, and here's the movie from that. And she turns on the light, and the animals are showing a precise avoidance of some location in a space they've never been in before. And if you do this for a lot of animals, you can find out that um, if you activate, if you tag uh, the, the cells in the same way, but with no channel rhodopsin, they behave a chance in a neutral environment when you turn the light on. Um, this is the memory tag cells with the channel rhodopsin, and uh, we can also uh, control tag them in a neutral environment, and you, you still get the uh, uh, chance behavior. Claudia started to look at these cells, and about 15 or so percent of the cells we can demonstrate are actually optogenetically uh, activated, and if uh, this just shows you their activity over a, a course time of, uh, I would say, 20 minutes. Um, and if you uh, uh, do PCA, on this a, a, a linear dimensionality reduction, you can't really separate these two patterns of activity very well, but a nonlinear um, isomap algorithm does a really great job of separating the, uh, the light stimulus on versus the stimulus off uh, uh, patterns. And it doesn't take a lot of imagination to recognize that these two patterns in that um, subspace actually are very similar. They're just uh, rotated and translated uh, to each other, which was a clue. I'll come back to that um, towards the end. So Elliot went on his merry way and recorded cells um, across these three weeks in the box in the cylinder. And you can see the, the basic uh, phenomena. If you only take the 20% of the cells and you measure how stable they are across time, many of them are stable in this blue uh, histogram. Um, and if you look at them across different environments, uh, the majority certainly uh, uh, show the remapping phenomena. They have no relationship in their spatial tuning. If you consider all the cells, it becomes very difficult to tell these two uh, histograms apart. <clears throat> what if you just look at all of the cells um, and you consider a uh, activity vector and you simply uh, uh, plot the uh, correlation 
Here our delta t for everything I'll do is uh, one second. And you can see when the animal's in the box or the cylinder in one environment, the, act, the, high, the activity is highly correlated. Um, highly correlated is above, say, 0.2 or so. And it's not so well correlated uh, when you compare the activity in the environment, uh, one environment with the other different environment. Um, it's, non, it's not zero, but it's certainly uh, uh, less. And you can recognize, and if you like remapping, you can plot the data this way. If you don't like remapping, you can plot it this way. Um, the data are fairly uh, ambiguous, but the take home message is, is the pattern of activity is not very different in the cylinder and the uh, square. They're not strikingly different. And you can demonstrate that they are statistically different here across uh, uh, time. Um, across the uh, uh, two-week period of comparison, those differences become really quite, quite uh, uh, marginal. So we decided to examine those activity uh, vectors and, and, and ask the question, is it really important to have the uh, place cell activity at all? So we did the trick uh, that uh, Bob Muller and, and I worked out, which is figure out an expected rate from a Poisson model, and we could subtract that from what we observed and just look at what was left over. And we call that a position tuning independent rate. And if you plot the, if you use that as a time series, obviously you've removed all the spatial uh, modulation and you get no place fields at all. But all of the activity correlations that I just showed you are preserved. In fact, they're even better. These deviations from the uh, firing that you'd expect from the place fields actually allow you much better separation. The separation increases, and it actually persists uh, uh, well across uh, uh, weeks. So we did some uh, SVM decoding. As you, you've heard, we chose SD SVM here because we could get an estimate of how good a particular cell pair in this case. And we could do this for the actual recorded data or the PTI data. The, the answers are, are the same. And we can reliably decode accurately, very accurately, which uh, environment the animal happens to be in um, with these decoders. But importantly, we can identify to what extent a particular pair contributes to the uh, uh, decoding weight. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll get back to that in a moment. What I hope uh, I just want to highlight, we've shown you that optogenetically activating these uh, memory tag cells with re without regard to space, we're just pulsing the light, that was sufficient to express a specific spatial memory. Okay? And we know that spatial memory really exquisitely depends on the, on the hippocampus. The majority of cells are not place cells in a given environment, but their co-firing relationships are really useful for discriminating those environments. And co-firing relationships in general right, are not that stable. That's a fact I'm going to have to uh, uh, deal with, and we will. Um, similar to place fields not being stable across long periods of time that memories and, and the animal's uh, knowledge about space uh, actually persist. I want to come back to this uh, jumbotron uh, picture that I showed you. This jumbotron picture is actually a video. Um, and for years, I used to play the video and then apologize. Come on. Unbelievable. The one time I want to show the movie. What, what happens in this, uh, in this video is it's animated. The, um, the lights change, the temporal patterns change, the size of the message change, but you can still recognize uh, the message game over. And I used to apologize when I showed this to my undergraduates and say, well, the brain doesn't really work this way. It's probably just the pattern, and the pattern should be reliable and recognizable over time. And we've changed uh, our, our, that, that point of view, because as many of you understand, if you computed the right covariance matrix here, you'd be able to recognize game over or be able to uh, have a machine recognize game over no matter how it was uh, uh, displayed, even if the uh, movie wouldn't thwart me. And so we use that point of view for examining um, uh, our data. We, we examined, we used uh, persistent um, homology to try and identify what the uh, topology of, of these uh, recordings would be, of the calcium imaging recordings. And we ended up uh, finding out it, it seems to have one component. Um, if you use the isomap um, algorithm here, you can see that it seems to be, uh, have exist in some sort of low dimensional space and, and uh, linear uh, dimensionality reduction doesn't capture that nearly as well. 
And what you're seeing here is a projection of uh, three environments, the animal in the home cage in black, um, blue in the box, or um, uh, red in the cylinder. And you can almost see that the activity, and this is from, I think, 377 cells, um, organizes each dot represents the activity across that ensemble during one second. And it's sort of organized in, in what looks like a, a, a reasonable plane. And so we, we examined uh, that, and I'll come back to um, this, uh, uh, this idea that many of the cells were, uh, when we looked at them and looked at the SVM weights, turned out to be uh, cells I'll, rec I'll identify as anti-co-firing. They're anti-co-firing because if you count the number of other cells with which they're correlated and their correlations are, are less than, are significant and less than uh, minus 0.05, um, they're a minority of the cells. They're about 15 to 20 percent of the cells, um, but we can identify them that way. And if we looked at this activity projected into the, um, if we, we, we say, let's imagine the space is uh, 60 or, or 100 dimensions, I mean, we, we calculate various things about the uh, uh, distribution. What we can recognize is when we look at all of the cells and we remove the anti-co-firing cells, we really change that distribution, uh, the dimensionality, if you will, compared to removing a random uh, similar number of cells. And you can sort of see um, what that looks like here. Um, we're going to project the, those, that activity into three dimensions here, and you can look here at the overlap between the box, the gray, and the, uh, and the red, the cylinder. And that overlap is, uh, is about uh, 0.5 percent when you take all the cells from this ensemble. When you remove the anticorrelated cells, the overlap becomes much greater. The anticorrelated cells seem to be the cells that keep the uh, ensembles uh, 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 separate. And here's a way to quantify that across the uh, uh, recording days. And that's also something that seems learned. And what I want to show you um, as we come to the end here is that our prior work has, we've looked at the entorhinal cortex and in particular in the uh, head direction system there. And what we see is that these representations, even of head direction, tend to be multi-stable. Within a, the same recording, they'll change their orientation as if the animal is taking a fix to one cue or another in the environment. And so we use that same approach here to sort of estimate how stable these uh, manifold patterns might be. Um, and it turns out if you take activity across, say, 40, 40 seconds to, uh, to a minute or so, um, uh, that activity is stable. And so that's what we, we, we do. And if you look at this video, I hope the video plays, you can see here um, a trajectory through this um, uh, space. And what's shown here in this plane is the best fit plane to the last 60, um, 60 seconds of data. And you can see the angle tends not to shift very much. Okay. It shifts maybe three or four times occasionally um, after a couple of minutes uh, within this environment. And um, there was a big shift, and now it maintains again. And when the uh, box um, uh, recording comes, you'll see that there will be a big shift, and it will occupy a different uh, 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 part of this space. And if I were to make this uh, figure, um, this movie, after removing the anticorrelated cells, you'll see that these two patterns become uh, rather similar. In fact, that's what I'm going to do. Okay. And I'm going to do that in a particular case. In this case, we, we, we recorded the animals in a uh, new experiment. Here the animals are in the what looked like the identical environment. You would not be able to tell these two environments apart because the only way they're different is that I put a, um, a, a a quarter inch piece of clear plastic on the floor uh, so that that's the only difference between these two environments. It looks the same and when the animal is in the, the environment that doesn't have the plastic, we can turn on shock and the animal will feel shock and will try and avoid a particular location. So the animals are given a conditioned memory here as you'd seen before. And that's the only difference. And if you look behaviorally, I won't show it to you, it's not hard to imagine, the animals have a conditioned response in the trained environment, and they don't have a conditioned response in the untrained environment. That's the, uh, what I showed you that Claudia had done. 
And so we can compute the activity vectors from the calcium recordings, the similarity of the patterns across these um, recordings. And not surprisingly, although the animal has a robust memory and different behavior here, the activity patterns are very similar. And we've published this uh, um, uh, elsewhere um, for CA1 as well, and in this paper in the dentate gyrus. Very hard to tell them apart. However, look at, the, at this. I hope this plays. Yes. So here are the, here are the activity vectors projected into this um, isomap space for the trained and the untrained, uh, or ex experience in the trained and the untrained uh, space. You can really recognize that they are distinctive. If you remove the anticorrelated cells, um, the anti-co-firing cells, those are the cells that have a, a substantial number or the, the highest number of, of uh, partner cells to which they are uh, uh, anti-correlated. Um, you can see that those, um, those two patterns become much harder, uh, much harder to distinguish. And so this is how we think about the, how the hippocampus represents uh, these two spaces. And I'll show that in a cartoon. There's a formal model in this that starts out the paper that I, uh, I've left out. But we imagine that the co-firing relationships of these cells are mostly fixed. They're mostly stable, and, and, and the, the work in synaptic plasticity we, uh, has, has suggested that, that those inputs are fixed in large part because um, the inputs from the temporal monic pathway into uh, CA1 tend not to change very much uh, from the entorhinal cortex to CA1 as well as uh, uh, CA3. And so um, what does change is, this ant is how these anti-co-firing cells cause the registration of this manifold with the environmental cues. And those anti-co-firing cells, uh, by conjecture or hypothesis, is they are very well-tuned or strongly tuned to the sensory uh, features of the, uh, of the environment. So what we're really operating with or watching is the hippocampal activity that is able to fire in ways that it wants to fire, if you will, independent of the uh, cues in the environment. As I've shown you from the early uh, e experiments, uh, the hippocampus seems to be able to make that choice. And depending on the, the details of the environment, which cues um, happen to, uh, to be um, uh, strongly driving the activity of place cells, then, or, or of any cells, they turn out not to need to be place cells, then the activity can be stably projected into the world in a particular way, and that looks like remapping uh, uh, to us, but is really a solid object, if you will, a rigid object being uh, reoriented, and so hence called uh, uh, re-registration. So I'll just, um, uh, what are the takeaways? That there seems to be some kind of manifold organization. If you look at uh, hippocampal population activity uh, that's informative about locations or memories or even uh, uh, tastes, as, as we've uh, uh, seen, it's internal, internally organized. And it seems to be internally organized according to these uh, co firing relationships on the time scales of hundreds to, to uh, a, a few seconds. And it's low dimensional. You know, given the nature, this manifold nature of these representations, many of our intuitions and, and conclusions from the single cell observations, as I uh, hope to have argued, can actually be uh, uh, misleading when we consider them um, in terms of uh, the, the, the system functions of this um, are relevant to cognition. I'm going to argue, and, and from, from here on out, um, suggest that re-registering re actually better describes what we call remapping as a field. And because that's rather than reorganize in, in response to some sort of stimulus, the activity is relatively invariant when considered from this manifold point of view or from an internal um, uh, um, uh, origin point of view. Um, and it may more be, um, be more reasonable to imagine that these manifolds are fit to the inputs and are controlled by cells that are predominantly uh, these anti-co-firing uh, cells. And our speculation and our research program um, uh, moves in this direction that it's transforming population activity through the synaptic uh, networks that we study using uh, molecules like PCAM zeta, that that actually can provide a fast, reliable, and very efficient uh, uh, to learn set of computations 
that are useful for encoding and, and recollecting information uh, of many types, not just um, uh, spatial information. So with that, I thank you for your attention. I'm very happy to take questions. And I want to thank um, people highlighted here in, in red in particular who contributed uh, uh, to this work, and NINDS and NIMH uh, in particular for funding uh, this, the work I presented here today. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Andre. Uh, we'll take questions at the two mics here, and also uh, if anyone enters them on the Hoover app. Uh, go ahead over there. Hey, Andre. Uh, lovely talk. Um, yeah, really, really impressive. Um, so I didn't quite understand. So I thought you said two things that might conflict with each other about what the source of this uh, stable manifold is. Uh, at some points, I thought you were saying it was to do with enterinal input, and at other points, I thought you were you were saying it was internal organization within the hippocampus. And so I'd just like you to clarify which of I see, is. sure. Th thank you. I didn't mean to confuse you on that uh, notion. There are multiple inputs. And, and so what we imagine that keeps this stable, and the reason for that is we have looked for which synapses, which collections of synapses change as the animals learn this. And the synapses that do not change are the temporomonic inputs. There are plenty, there's plenty of our molecule PKM zeta there, but it doesn't seem to be sensitive to the animal's experiences that we are able to witness. The changes that we can observe are in the Schaefer collaterals, the CA3 inputs. And, and in other work that we've done, we've been able to show that the hippocampus can switch from an encoding state, if you will, the, you know, the, the place cells seem to signal where the animal currently is to a recollection state somewhere over there, non-local firing, in particular when the dominant input is through the Schaefer collaterals. So these two different sets of synapses afford different properties, one keeping the manifold together is our conjecture, and the other doing the registration. Thanks for uh, helping me clarify. Okay, we'll take over here. Hi, Andre. Hi, Kay Tack hey, from hey, Salt Kay. and HHMI. Um, as a hippocampal world outsider, I found that really clarifying and that was a very helpful framework. My question is about the co-firing neurons. Um, I, I guess I'd like you to speculate about two things. One, what is the hierarchical organization of the co-firing neurons relative to all the other neurons that are holding those, the intact manifolds, so to speak? And also, just what kind of inputs do you think are unique or, you know, just Anatomically, how do you speculate um, the co-firing neurons are, are performing their process, getting the input they need, and then uh, sort of, you know, guiding traffic? Great. So we are investigating that actively. I can tell you a few properties. Each environment or each memory, because we also study um, multiple memories that are distinctive in the same environment. So each one of those ideas, environment or memory, seems to have a different co-firing subset. So that's the first thing. So I'm not, it would not appear that there's anything particularly unique about co-firing cells. They're not born being co-firing cells, if you will. They are environment or representation uh, uh, specific, if you will. Um, we also don't have uh, much to say about their other properties. Uh, that's something we're actively investigating, and I think we'll take active uh, experiments of, of uh, Q manipulations uh, in order to do that. Um, our conjecture is that those cells will be the cells that are, in particular, strongly affiliated, if you will, with elements in the environment, um, like the, the Q cards that were initially uh, manipulated. A reason for saying that <clears throat> is that we've shown by recordings in the entorhinal cortex, and in particular in the head direction cell system, because that was easy, easiest to, um, to demonstrate, is that those cells will also change their registration to the environment according to what the animal will look at uh, moment to moment. And that change seemed to be uh, um, specific to edges of, of um, orienting cues, entrances into the environment, and my postdoc hung a uh, soft toy in the curtains, and I always told her it was meaningless and, and I was wrong. Uh, the cells orient to that, too. 
our questions over there. Uh, hi, thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering if similar principles to the ones you described here for uh, spatial navigation might play a role in more sort of abstract cognitive functions. Um, so you might imagine like a stable manifold being shared across similar tasks that's then yes. registered by some task specific uh, anti-correlated cells or. So that, that's, that would be the most efficient uh, way I could imagine this system working. Uh, we, I don't have the answer, but I have the data that will answer that. Um, we recorded these cells in the two environments I showed you, in one environment with a, a conditioned response and an, and an unconditioned response, just foraging. And the third that I haven't told you about that we're working on is a um, taste recognition task where the animal actually doesn't ever leave its home cage. Um, but we figured out a way to make a hippocampus sensitive or hippocampus dependent taste recognition memory. And we'll try and answer the question by comparison across those three data sets. Thank you. All right, I think in the interest of time, we're uh, gonna call it there. I'm sorry, you could maybe catch up with him after the talk is over. You buy the beer and I'll talk. <laughs> Thank you again, Andre. <laughs>
This tells us that the cells lack LTP, but they can normally integrate their inputs. So with this relatively dramatic uh, physiological manipulation in hand, we then tested these mice on a battery of hippocampal and NMDA receptor dependent behaviors. We were quite surprised to find that many of these classical tasks were unaffected by abolishing this activity dependent insertion of AMP receptors. Instead, these syntaxin three conditional knockout animals had a specific deficit in novelty processing. And the task that was affected is shown here. So animals could explore two arms of a T maze for five trials. And then on the sixth trial, we remove the block and the animals can explore freely. What we find when we do this is that control animals prefer to explore this novel arm shown in this occupancy heat map, whereas syntaxin three conditional knockouts just behave randomly. So now knowing that this deficit in hippocampal coding uh, from, from abolishing LTP might be quite specific to novelty processing, allowed us to design a task that was compatible with neural recordings that could help us elicit some of these same processes and answer this question of what is the role of LTP in CA1 coding. So to do this, we trained animals to run in head-fixed uh, virtual reality, and we performed simultaneous two-photon calcium imaging in the hippocampus. So we use a similar viral approach. We take syntaxin three floxed animals, we inject the calcium indicator GCAMP as well as control M cherry, and to eliminate syntaxin three Cre along with M cherry. Then animals run this novel arm variant of a virtual Y maze I've schematized here. In order to control the occupancy of the two arms to help with play cell analysis, we force animals to take either a left or right turn on each trial. And then we randomly choose one arm to be the familiar arm. In this example, it's the left arm. And for the first set of trials on days one through five, animals will only be allowed to go down this familiar arm. And then on the last block, we'll randomly interleave familiar novel environments. And then as an internal control on the last day, they get to see both in the very beginning. And these two shaded regions here indicate different reward locations on the two arms. And this task design, while somewhat unconventional for a VR task, allows us to simultaneously test spatial coding, reward coding, context discrimination, and novelty processing. So when we recorded neurons in this task, we were actually quite surprised to find that syntaxin three, knocking out syntaxin three LTP does not uh, affect spa spatial coding. So here on the left, you're seeing all of the play cells we recorded from the control condition across the whole uh, experimental setup here. So in each row of one of these heat maps, you have the trial averaged activity of a single cell as a function of position. On the top row, you have all the familiar trials. On the bottom row, you have all the novel trials. And within each row, cells are sorted by their location of peak activity from half of the trials on day three. So these uh, bands of activity you see across the diagonal here indicate that more or less the same spatial map is present on every day. And then we can visualize remapping by then taking the novel trials and applying the familiar trial sorting, or vice versa, taking the familiar trial activity, applying the novel sorting. And you see a common coding for the stem of the maze and then complete remapping on the arms. And all of this is what we expected. This is sort of typical place cell behavior in a task like this. But if we look at the syntaxin three conditional knockouts, here we're only looking at the M cherry cells, so we know all of these cells lack C1 LTP, we see basically the same result. You have stable spatial coding, a common coding for the stem of the maze, and then complete remapping on the arms. And we saw no difference in within or across day stability, nor was there any difference in the ability to decode position from these. So this also explains why we had such a specific behavioral deficit. The animals have, while lacking C1 LTP, they have stable and accurate representations of both position and context that they can use to solve the task. So this, this was quite surprising to us and a little unexpected. So we turned to modeling to see if we could make sense of this result. And we found that actually a very simple circuit model can explain inherited spatial representations without LTP. So in this little toy model that we used, we have a set of CA3 place cells. They connect randomly to a set of CA1 neurons. And then we can induce sparsity in this layer through a K winner take all threshold. We can model the control condition by having these weights update according to a noisy Hebbian rule. And we can model the Cree condition by just letting them randomly fluctuate. And regardless of whether LTP was intact, we found that this model predicts stable spatial coding. So here I have a few example cells from the LTP model and the no LTP model. Trials are on the vertical axis, position on the horizontal. This heat map indicates the activity of the unit. So you see a stable spatial code in both of these cells. This can also be seen at the level of population activity. So now you're looking at all of the spatially selective cells from either model and uh, their activity as a function of position on the first and last trials where cells are sorted by their location on the last trial. 
But as might be apparent from these two example cells that I showed you here, this model does predict that the place cells should differ in several more subtle coding properties. The first is that place fields should be wider when LTP is intact, which you can see in these difference between the place fields here. And the second is that when LTP is intact, you should have fewer place fields per cell, which is shown here as well. So this gives us some predictions to look for in our actual data. So here's the model predictions again at the top, wider place fields when LTP is intact, and fewer place fields per cell. And when we look in the actual data, here on the left we have just the place field width. Um, so you see the place fields are consistently wider when LTP is intact, and each dot here is the average place field width from a single mouse. And our prediction for the number of place fields uh, per cell holds up as well. This model suggests that in general, LTP shouldn't be needed for stable spatial coding in CA1. As long as cells can appropriately integrate their inputs and you have normal inhibition intact, and instead, signatures of LTP in the population might show up because of these differences in the single cell properties. So these findings encourage us to take this idea of inherited coding from CA3 more seriously. And as a conceptual extension of our model, we hypothesize that LTP isn't really recomputing the representation that's already present in CA3, but instead it's layering another level of computational complexity on top of those representations. So if that's the case, then without LTP, CA1 place codes should appear much more CA3-like in their other coding properties. We checked for three coding differences that are known to be specific to CA1 and not present in CA3. The first is that CA1 representations tend to over-represent rewards, and this is less the case in CA3. Place fields in novel environments in these linear tracks tend to shift backwards in CA1, whereas they tend to be more static in CA3. And lastly, CA1 neurons tend to non-specifically increase their firing rates in novel environments, whereas CA3 do not. And we found evidence that CA1 LTP is necessary for each of these properties, but for the sake of brevity, I'll just focus on these last two uh, that focus on novelty processing. So first, the place field shifting in novel environments. Here on the left, I'm plotting the activity of a few co-recorded neurons uh, from the novel trials on day one, from an example control animal. This white arrow here indicates this backward shifting phenomenon. And you can see a variety of shifting time scales, even within the same mouse, from these five or 10 trial shifts to more abrupt shifts, much more like the behavioral time scale synaptic plasticity that's been described. Whereas all of these effects are blunted in the, in the Cree animals. We can quantify this by looking at the average population vector shift for each mouse during these novel trials. And we find that the control animals have a significantly larger magnitude shift on these novel trials compared to the syntaxin three conditional knockouts, and that all of these effects are gone after the first day. And lastly, we'll just show this increase in firing rate in novel environments. Here I've plotted the average population activity across all the mice on novel arm trials from day one, where here trial zero indicates the start of the novel trials. For both groups of animals, we see an increase in the activity rate, but it's substantially larger in the control animals. And unlike the backward shifting phenomena, we see that this effect actually gets stronger across days. So in this project, we took a novel approach for manipulating LTP that allowed us to disentangle these roles of inherited neural dynamics and, and synaptic plasticity in driving place cell activity. Our results provide evidence that CA1 can inherit place cell sequences from upstream inputs even without LTP, and that this can be accounted for by even very simple network models. Instead, CA1 LTP seems to be mostly engaged during these salient events, such as novel environments and reward anticipation, and this helps form things like predictive codes in CA1. This result also explains the specificity of our behavioral findings. This novelty T maze was likely specifically affected because CA1 LTP seems to be mostly involved in, say, novelty processing and isn't necessary for recomputing the code that's already present in CA3. But this relegation of LTP to salience processing might be specific to CA1's role in this circuit. CA1 has been long hypothesized to serve a special role in, in novelty detection, and elucidating the role of LTP in other parts of the circuit or in other circuits in the brain in general may require a similar approach where you know both how the circuit behaves at baseline and also what the inputs to that circuit are doing at baseline. With that, I'll wrap up and thank all the members of the Giacomo Lab, and of course, Constantine and his advisors, Tom and June, and uh, thank you all for, for giving me the chance to speak. Start with a question over here on this side. Hello. Oh, congratulations on the beautiful data. Um, Denise Kai from Mount Sinai. Um, can you? Uh, I think I missed it. Why is there wider place fields when LTP is intact in CA1? 
Yeah, so this kind of agrees with um, the older, mile, older models by like Myonk Meta and more of the BTSP models as well, where basically the uh, CA3 inputs that have some place field that slightly overlaps with the CA1 place field tend to get increased. And so as you increase those strengths, the, the place fields get wider. Well, thank you again. If there are no more questions, that's great. All right, please join me in welcoming our next speaker, who will be Anna Spector. Hello everyone, my name is Anna and I'm going to tell you about the hierarchical representation of sequences in human and rhinal cortex. In this work, we were interested in understanding how the brain represents sequences. First, I will show that in a task with very simple sequences, some cells in the human medial temporal lobe code the positions in sequence abstractly. They have a coordinate system. Then. I will discuss how this coordinate system is a bit similar to the coordinate system of space that is encoded in grid cells. Next, I will describe a fMRI result showing that in a task involving complex hierarchical sequences, the human and rhinal cortex displays another famous property of grid cells, a hierarchical anatomical gradient. Let's start with a simple sequence of four elements, A, B, C, D. How is it represented in the brain? The first option is to strengthen the synapses between the neurons representing neighboring elements. We know that this type of representation happens in the brain, for example, through Hebbian plasticity. However, this associative representation is not useful when encountering a different sequence which has the same structure but different elements. Another option is to represent the structure of the sequence separately from the elements. Here, there is an independent representation of the abstract position in the sequence, one, two, three, and four. These are like coordinates that can then be tied to different specific stimuli. For example, both in Oxford and in Lisbon, breakfast, work, dinner, sleep represents an abstract structure of my day, even if food in each meal is different. We recorded cells in medial temporal lobe of epilepsy patients while they were learning such simple sequences of four elements. For example, trial one was dog, football, key, chili. We then asked them where one of the stimuli was. In trial one, we asked them where the football was and they had to respond position two. Crucially, we swapped the order of the stimuli in each trial. This meant that we could look for these abstract representations that we talked about before. If a cell responds to different pictures at the same position, it is coding for this position abstractly. Here are some cells that you already know about, just to get you used to looking at the data. I'm plotting each cell as four waves, one for each picture. Each cycle in, is in a wave is a different position in the sequence. For example, you can see from these red bits that this cell fires just after the football was presented, no matter which position it was in. This is a football cell. In the same way, this is a key cell. This cell is more interesting. It fired more at position one, no matter which object was presented. It is coding for this position abstractly. It is a coordinate cell. Here is one that is coding for position three abstractly. And here is one that fires anywhere apart from position one. What does this look like in the population? On the left is the number of significant cells. In both regions, more cells coded for positions than pictures. On the right is the variance explained by the position and picture factors across the entire population. Both factors are way above chance. But more importantly, this abstract coordinate representation explains as much of the variance as the famous stimulus representation. Another coordinate system in the medial temporal lobe is the grid cell system, 
Three cells in the entrinal cortex represent structure of spatial environments in an abstract way. They are a coordinate system for space. We also now know that grid cells are representations of possible sequences. Many recent models have shown that grid cells emerge directly from sequence models. And the only difference between these sequences and our sequence is these spatial sequences are constrained to Euclidean to d dimensional manifolds. Famously, grid cells are also hierarchical. And amazingly, you can see this hierarchy in the anatomy. Low frequency grids are found in the most ventral parts of the entrinal cortex and high frequency grids in the dorsal parts. Actually, many sequences in the real world are also hierarchical. Meals make up days, days make up weeks, etc., etc. This is a classic hierarchy. To describe it in a coordinate system, you need three coordinates, one for each layer. For example, this event is on the second week on the first day, and it is the fourth event on that day. It has coordinates two, one, and four. We are going to look for the same anatomical hierarchy, but in non-spatial sequences. We are going to use humans and fMRI. However, in humans, the brain is a bit twisted. So the gradient we would expect is actually anterior to posterior. Instead of the sequence of meals, we are going to use an auditory sequence. That is, participants are going to listen many times to a long sequence of sounds. This is a schematic of the full sequence. It looks complicated, but I will unfold it slowly for you. The red bars represent sounds that repeat many times. Instead of breakfast, work, dinner, sleep, we used four notes. To, do, di, da. Then we add layers to the sequence to make it hierarchical. The chunks I just showed you repeat to form days. It goes like, to do di da, to do di da, to do di da, bam bam, where bam bam represents a change. It is a weekend. <laughs> then those weeks repeat three times, and they form a month. And then those months repeat three times. This is a four layers hierarchy. After two days of learning the sequence, the next day they come in, and we are going to do one more critical thing. We are going to pair pictures with particular places in the sequence. We are going to play the whole sequence, again, 25 times. But when it gets to a particular place, we are going to flash an image on the screen. For example, this apple has coordinates 1, 3, 1, 2. Note that two pictures can be presented during the same sound, but have three out of four different coordinates. OK, so here is a schematic with the same stimuli. On the next day, in the fMRI scanner, they only saw the pictures in a random order. We hoped that the pictures would tag the representations of the sequence coordinates. Because we could present the pictures in a random order, we could measure those coordinates without worrying about autocorrelations and things like that. To check that the tagging worked, we looked at where in the brain the patterns of voxel activity were similar for pictures that were paired with the same sounds. For example, the book and the airplane were paired with the same sound, even though they were miles away in the sequence. These pictures had similar representations in auditory cortex and hippocampus. This means that the tagging worked. The picture reactivated the same sound. OK, but now we're going to look for the coordinate system. We can do this in exactly the same way as I just showed you. But now we are going to look for the voxel representations that are similar, not when the sounds are similar, but when the coordinates are similar. Because each picture has four coordinates, it is going to give us four different tests. Here is what we found. A clear anatomical gradient with high frequencies at the back and low frequencies at the front. To understand this, let's look at the apple and the airplane. They have the same low frequency coordinate, but different high frequency coordinate. 
they will have similar voxel representations at the front of the entrinal cortex. Instead, the book and the airplane have very different frequency coordinates. They are miles apart in the sequence. But they are in the same location in the green layer. Their representations are different at the front of the entrinal cortex, but similar in this green area further back. This is just like grid cells in space. Okay, so we've shown it's a hierarchy, but we haven't shown it's a coordinate system yet. For this, it needs to generalize over different sequences. There was one thing I didn't tell you in this really complicated task description. Actually, they didn't learn just one sequence. They learned two. The sequences had the same structure, but different sounds and pictures. The gradient I've shown you used all trials within and across sequence. This is how the gradient looks if I only use distances between pictures that were presented in the same sequence. Crucially, the same gradient is there, representing distances across sequences, even if stimuli in different sequences were never experienced together. This is an independent replication of the gradient. Overall, we showed that there is an abstract position code in the entrinal cortex. Exactly as with spatial coordinates, those positions are represented hierarchically in the entrinal cortex. And this hierarchy lies along a posterior to anterior gradient. Okay, I want to stop here, and I also want to use the rest of my talk to speak about the war in Ukraine. I cannot stay silent as I was born in Russia. It is an unforgivable, terrifying crime being committed by the Russian government. Already thousands have died in Ukraine, and citizens of several cities are hiding in bomb shelters without war, food, or electricity. I will not go into more details, as I'm sure this audience is well informed. I could say a lot about how the same criminal government is destroying all freedoms in Russia with enormous speed. I won't, because it feels inappropriate given what Ukrainian people are going through right now. However, I thought that you might want to know that more than 7,000 scientists in Russia have spoken up against this war. As I see it, the main steps now that one can take are first to intensify protests in order to put pressure on world governments to do more, and second, as individuals, continue helping those whose lives are being destroyed. Here is a list of organizations put together by the Oxford University Ukrainian Society. And I want to mention two more that are close to my heart. In the first one, we help women and kids in Ukraine to find as safe as possible routes to leave the country. You can help either by donating money that will go to transport, food, or medicine, or by volunteering to host people who already cross the border. And the second organization is forbidden in Russia, but they're doing very important work helping thousands of detained protesters. Here is a code for donations. I hope the codes work, but if they don't, here is my email. And lastly, I want to finish it by thanking this amazing team of people, with special thanks to Alon, who helped a lot in making this talk, and to Tim for all his supervision and support. I will be happy to answer questions on both topics. If there are questions, uh, we will take them at the two microphones. Over here. Uh, hi, I have just one question about this, um, showing this, uh, like putting the sound for the, for the patients or for the uh, subjects. Uh, can, can you go back to this slide, please? I mean, there was like a different sequence in the last slide, and I'm just wondering why. Um, 
So do you mean, do you mean this? Uh, uh, yeah, there's like, in the end, there's like sound HHH, and in every, uh, every step before, there was like different. So the sounds like the weekend, which is EE, like just bum bum, are there to signal transition between layers. So between blue layers, it's EE. Between next, like to represent transition in months, it's FFGJ. And then the three sounds you're asking about are to indicate that the sequence is ending because they were listening it on repeat. So it was yeah, like a landmark that it's ending. Okay. So we use this like distant, different sounds um, to show when there was a transition in the layers. Question over there, one more. Yeah, um, I, I sympathize with, with your view that, that you, you have these fixed sequences and you map elements onto the sequence, but there is a big problem um, in the way that humans are able to zoom in and out of different hierarchies. So, you know, you, you might have learned all of this, and then on top of that, you may learn uh, decades and centuries and um, maybe even I don't know, millennia, if, if you're uh, um, studying history. So um, how, how could you add more layers in the hierarchy if they're so fixed already? So that's a very good question. And exactly because of this, we could not use the hierarchies which already are known to participants. We had to teach them a new hierarchy, which is our sequence of sounds. And there we could regulate how many layers we are presenting to them. And if you, want, if you wanted to add one more layer, we could do it just by the structure of the auditory sequence. So by introducing them with this auditory sequence, we had like a controlled way of like defining the hierarchy we're measuring. I see, but uh, if, if the subjects started coding it at the wrong level, they would run out of levels to encode it. So wouldn't so, that predict that there's a maximum number of levels they can learn? I think that if we would use a sequence with a different number of levels, that, so actually our four layers are taking almost all entrinal cortex. So I would expect that if we used five layers, the representation would scale to fit in the entrinal cortex, that it's not like fixed, this part is for uh, the fourth layer, it's adapting to how many layers you need to learn. And here it took them two days to learn this hierarchy. It's not that they knew it from the first time they listened to it. So I think this representation like evolved while they were learning it over two days. All right, thank you again, Anna. <laughs> All right, our final speaker for this session is uh, Nikul Yadav. We'll be talking about neocortical features, uh, feature codes which drive memory recall. Hi everyone, I'm really excited to present the work that I've been doing for the past few years in trying to understand how brains process contextual information, store it as a memory to be able to be recalled later. So contextual memory is the unification of multiple streams of sensory information entwined in a spatio-temporal framework. For example, my memory from my last year birthday dinner includes salient details such as the friends who were there, the, the gifts I received, uh, the ambience of the place, and so on. So essentially, this contextual memory can be deconstructed into its constituent features. And then we often rely on these features to be able to recall the memory in future. Foundational studies have shown that dorsal hippocampus merges these features into a conjunctive representation, which is a result of the recurrent architecture of the circuits in this region. However, the neural basis of feature representations is still unknown. And it is indeed import important for us to represent these features alongside this conjunctive representation so that we can recognize them and recall a memory whenever we need it. Or in case of high memory interference, where we have to rely on these distinct cues to be able to recall memory with high fidelity. Or encountering these features multiple times help, help build a predictive model of the world, the semantic knowledge of things around us. So to understand how features are represented, I designed a virtual reality-based behavior task where I train the mice on three different contexts, reward, neutral, and aversive. And each context is made of four different cues 
visual, olfactory, auditory, and tactile that come on together. I provide sucrose as reinforcement for the reward context and an air puff for the aversive context. So once the mice have learned to associate these cues with the reinforcement, I move them to the retrieval phase, where I challenge these mice with a subset of cues from the original context, which I term as features, and test whether they can recall the original context that these features came from and modulate their lick rates. So for example, here I'm plotting the lick profile of a single mouse across different feature presentations. And as you can see in the reward features, mice tend to increase their licking upon presentation into in a trial, the trial onset marked by this dashed line. Uh, in aversive features, we observe that the mice suppress their lick rate in anticipation of an aversive outcome. So when all the cues are present, which I term as A, V, O, and P, mice tend to prefer the reward context over the aversive context as indicated by this lick rate frequency. However, this trend holds across all features that we present to, such as combination of auditory and olfactory, which I term as A, O, olfactory and tactile, which is OT, uh, where mice still tend to prefer the reward features over the aversive. So once the mice have reliably performed this feature-based task, I ask the question, how are features represented in CA1? So I record the activity of these neurons using genetically encoded calcium indicators, GCAM6F, gaining optical access through the gradient index lens and imaging the same field of view across training and retrieval sessions. And this is the data set that I'm analyzing. What I find is that most task responsive CA1 neurons tend to respond across all features of a particular context. For example, this reward selective neuron is selective to all features of the reward context as indicated by this average DF over F curves, compared to the aversive selective neuron which is responding across all features of the aversive context. And indeed, across all sessions in mice, we observe that high fraction of CA1 neurons tend to encode this conjunctive representation, whereas only a chance level fraction of neurons are selective to a particular feature. So this made us ask the question, if not in CA1, where do the feature representations emerge? And how do they engage with the downstream CA1 conjunctive representations during memory recall? So I retrogradely labeled all neurons that have a direct monosynaptic access to these uh, CA1 conjunctive representations using a retrograde tracer and found two key regions that are involved in memory processing, the anterior cingulate cortex and the lateral entorhinal cortex. So I asked the question of how the computations in AC or LEC affect the recruitment of these downstream CA1 conjunctive representations. To do that, I record the activity of CA1 neurons while the mice are performing this task, meanwhile simultaneously inhibiting the activity of AC or LEC using an inhibitory opsin. So to show you how the raw data looks, these are examples of two neurons, where on light on trials, we see a robust inhibition in the activity, uh, light on trials indicating whether uh, AC or LEC were being inhibited, compared to light off trials, where these neurons are responding every time to a feature presentation trial. This compared to the other two neurons, which show no such change in the activity across light on and light off trials, indicating that activity was not dependent on AC or LEC input. So when I take into account all CA1 neurons, I observe that both AC and LEC inhibition tend to inhibit almost equal fraction of CA1 neurons. However, when we only take into account the CA1 context neurons, I observe that AC inhibition tends to substantially inhibit this population compared to when we inhibit LEC. So this hinted to us that there's a preferential coupling of AC with these downstream CA1 conjunctive codes. But to understand how the CA1 contextual inhibition translates to a behavioral recall deficit, I inhibited AC bilaterally in half the trials, keeping the other half as controls, and I measured the performance of these mice as a normalized lick rate difference across the reward and aversive trials with the features here presented on the x-axis. In the light off trials, when there's no inhibition, mice are performing this task well. However, in light on trials, upon active inhibition of AC, we observe that there's a suppression of this recall index or the performance of the mice uh, across all different features presented, which means the mice are unable to discriminate between reward and aversive trials. However, we see no such deficit in the behavioral recall uh, when we inhibit LEC bilaterally or in the fluorophore controls that I'm not showing you here. So while CA1 encodes a conjunctive representation of the memory, 
AC seems to exert this top-down control over the retrieval, and the question is, what enables AC to exert this top-down control? So to gain insight into the computation and coding strat strategies of AC, I sought to record the activity of AC neurons while the mice are performing this task using GCAMP 6F, and it was the same field of view across training and retrieval sessions. This is the data set that I'm analyzing. Interestingly, what we find is that the AC neurons tend to respond selectively to a particular feature or show mixed selectivity. So for example, here I'm plotting the average DF over F responses of four different neurons uh, across all different features presented. And if I can redirect your attention towards this orange neuron that tends to respond uh, when all the cues are present, the ABOT, in aversive context. However, this purple neuron only responds when A, O, and T cues are present in the reward context, but doesn't respond across all the other features. This is in stark contrast to the activity of CA1 neurons that tend to respond across all features of the given context, thus exhibiting a conjunctive representation. And indeed, when we uh, sum the, or average the activity of these neurons uh, across all different features, I see this emergence of ensembles of neurons that are driving the feature selectivity, as you can see in this heat map. However, in CA1, you still do not see separable feature responses, and all the responses are almost contextual. So just to contrast the activity of this region with CA1, I observe minimal conjunctive representations, however, a substantially more feature-selective responses in, in this region. Since ensembles of neurons are showing this feature selectivity in AC compared to CA1, we would expect that an unbiased population trajectory analysis would also show similar feature clustering in the neural state space in CA1, however, feature separability in the state space in AC. So I leverage this co concept of contrastive loss in support vector machine as a method to identify how closely are features uh, distanced uh, when, when, there is, when they correspond to the same context, which I term as feature separation, versus how far apart are features when they're from the opposite context. So in, in CA1, we would expect the mean feature separation to be really low, and hence this clustering ratio is really high, in comparison to AC, where the mean feature separation is almost equal to the context separation, and hence the ratio is tending to one. And indeed, when I train this SVM across all uh, time points in the trial, I observe a high feature clustering ratio in AC, in CA1, compared to higher feature separability and low cl clustering ratio in AC. So I hope I've convinced you that while CA1 encodes a conjunctive representation of the memory, Anterior cingulate cortex parses it into its considered features, which enables it to exert a top-down control over retrieval. So the last question I wanted to ask is how do the feature ensembles in AC engage with these downstream CA1 conjunctive or contextual responses? So I designed this novel prep where I could record the activity of both of these regions simultaneously while the mice is performing the task in a volumetric fashion. Interestingly, what we find is that during training, the CA1 representations tend to get recruited on earlier compared to the AC representations. As you can see, the y-axis corresponds to the fraction of neurons recorded, uh, recruited uh, with respect to the time on the x-axis. However, during retrieval, there's this dynamic reversal where the anterior cingulate cortical representations tend to get recruited on earlier across all features and all trials compared to the hippocampal representations. And this is true across all mice where during training, uh, the CA1 representations tend to lead AC representations, however, they lag during retrieval, thus facilitating the salient memory recall. So our working model indicates a parallel encoding mechanisms of contextual memory in the brain, where AC tends to form an overcomplete representation of the stimulus space and exerts a top-down control over the CA1 conjunctive representations during retrieval. However, this dynamic reversal uh, that we saw earlier indicates that this instructive signal from CA1 is necessary for AC to learn and form these feature representations. Other groups have also shown that LEC is involved in associative learning, so it'll be interesting to follow up and understand how LEC uh, converges into this ACCA1 network, maybe with possible roles of learning and memory storage. With this, I would like to thank my mentor, Dr. Priyadha Satupati at Rockefeller University, the members of my lab who've really made this work possible, and my advisors from Cornell Medical School. Thank you.
right, uh, thank you. Uh, we've got one uh, question over here. Hi, I'm Denise Kai from Mount Sinai. Really exciting work. Um, so I missed how long it takes to train the mice because I think of you know AC being really important for systems consolidated memory, and I'm curious how your data fits in line with this idea that with indexing theory and you have these hub neurons in CA1 or they're indexing out to the cortex, but this is typically thought maybe happening over a longer period of time. So I was wondering about the you know uh, time dependence of AC. Yeah. So. Uh this task requires only three days of training. And then we do follow it up with three days of retrieval. So it seems like uh, initially we thought that AC forms these uh, representations independently of CA1. However, the preliminary data that we have indicates that if we inhibit CA1 uh, using some chemogenetic approach and image AC neurons, they do not tend to form these representations. So that indicates that this instructive signal from CA1 is necessary for AC to form these representations. All right, I think um, in order to stay on track, we're going to have to call it there. But thank you again very much for that talk. Um, I just wanted to make a quick announcement regarding the poster sessions. As many of you have noted, the uh, organization of the poster sessions yesterday night was less than optimal, let's say, to avoid um, potential contamination with what I so lovingly like to call 5G. Um, we have stretched the posters out a bit. Um, we've also hopefully moved all the food out of the poster sessions. Uh, and we would like to ask you to keep your masks on in the poster sessions unless you are really taking a sip of your drink. So do stay masked. Um, and then we would also, uh, like those of you who still feel that they won't want to um, present in the poster hall, invite you to take up one of the extra poster boards that we've installed outside of the poster session. Uh, in the, you'll find them there, right by the stairs. There's only eight of them. I don't know if that's going to be enough. We're playing it by ear. Um, let me know. I hope this is going to suffice. Um, stay in touch. <laughs>
Seems like I should wait till people <laughs> should wait till people get in here. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, no worries. <laughs> Apparently I'm amplified. Apparently. <laughs> I'm looking forward to your talk. Oh well, it'll be good. It'll be good. Also, it's three dimensions. Here we are, alive. Yeah. 
I'll wait till you give me the go ahead. I'll wait till you give me the go ahead. Like, wait till you're set. Sounds good, and I think we have most people, so I'm gonna go ahead. Okay. Hello, everybody. I hope you're well fortified with coffee and the wonderful snacks. Um, welcome to session number five. Uh, I'm Jennifer Gro from Duke University, and it's my pleasure to uh, chair this session on oscillations, network states, and arousal. And it's a particular pleasure to introduce our invited speaker, Professor Dr. Susanna Schreiber from Humboldt University of Berlin. Uh, professor Schreiber is a full professor of computational neurophysiology, which I happen to think is a wonderful title. Um, she also holds a professorship at the Einstein Foundation of Berlin. Uh, she is um, active in uh, various uh, professional and service roles, such as she is the vice chair of the German Ethics Council. She is the chair of the Bernstein uh, Network for Computational Neuroscience in Germany. And uh, I'm particularly excited about her talk because she's going to talk about something that I think um, we all thought we knew at one point um, and are now discovering we were wrong about. Um, to kind of paraphrase from Tolstoy, uh, happy families are all alike, but unhappy families are all different from one another. So we all, I think, uh, learned that action potentials were all alike, all, all or none, and the coding uh, potential in, in action potential was, was simply related to whether or not they occurred and when they occurred. Uh, Professor Schreiber is going to tell us about her work um, that uh, kind of um, chips away at that uh, sort of monolith of understanding of the action potential. Uh, her talk is entitled Desynchronizing Neural Networks with Homoclinic Action Potentials. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure I can live up to really, you know, revolutionizing action potentials. I think that's too much, but I hope that I can sensitize you a little bit for the fact that action potentials are not all the same and that there are circumstances where they actually may matter. But first, let me also say that I thank the organizers tremendously for inviting me here to this really exciting place. Um, I'm particularly excited in, in the true sense of the world because there's so many of you and I haven't given talks in the last two years. And it's so nice to see people in person, to meet people in person, so I hope um, that you're all enjoying it as much as I do. So thank you very much to the organizers. Um, but let's get into the talk. So I'll talk about, if this works, yeah, it does, about synchronizing networks with homoclinic action potentials, which is a topic my lab has in the last year become very excited about. So as an overview, I'll introduce you to the topic, then I'll start out at the single neuron level and action potential dynamics, and then slowly during the talk, we're going to progress towards networks and the effect that action potentials can have on network behavior. And I'll illustrate that with two examples in the context of temperature and the brain in the first example and a drosophila motor network in the second example. So we all know that the brain is full of rhythmic states, just to remind you, they occur in health and pathology. Um, I depicted here three examples, sharp wave ripples, which are these roughly 200 hertz oscillations, presumably involved in memory consolidation. But we also have other types of rhythmic activity, like these played out activity states here from Drosophila, where you see that the neurons don't all fire in the same, at the same phase, but there is the sequence. And in pathology, of course, very obvious, we have um, events like seizures where we have this sudden onset of this rhythmic activity um, which poses a problem for patients, of course. Now, what most rhythms have in common is that they can be triggered by, by very small changes. And I'm giving you two examples here. One is a hot water epilepsy, which happens in patients when they pour hot water over the head then an increase of two degrees Celsius in their brain suffices and the seizure is triggered. 
another example are febrile seizures that's in, occurring in young children. And I'm sure that those of you who have children, um, because we have such a large audience, there must also be parents in here whose children suffer a febrile seizure because it's fairly frequent in young children when they have an infection, a viral or bacterial infection, and they have a fever, that then a seizure occurs. And it's not only the temperature that's decisive here, but also a change in the pH. And I'll come back to that later in the talk. So one aspect, not the only one, but the central aspect in the talk is going to be what you see here. We have an oscillation here. This is a local field potential in a simulation. So it's basically the summed activity of the network. And you see that here you have these small elevations, but then a switch is induced. So you have some external factor that changes. And then suddenly you see these large scale oscillations. So pronounced and sudden onset ryth rhythmic activity. And the question is how can something like that occur? There are many different ways, but I'll focus on a particular one, and that is not the usual one, not the one that you see here. Because commonly we assume that a change, that we either have a change in the input, which you see here, to a network, or that you change the connections in the network. For example, via plasticity, yes, some may be lost or strengthened. This is not what we're talking about here, although these are very valid mechanisms to induce such rapid changes. What I'll focus on today is switches in the intrinsic dynamics of the cells. So instead of having blue neurons, we now have green neurons, but everything else, the topology of the network and so on, remains the same. So what are neuron intrinsic changes? What does the blue and green mean here? Um, one obvious example would be active dendrites. I'm mentioning that in particular because three years ago here at Coastline in Lisbon, there was this very nice talk by Jutta Poirasi about active dendrites and um, their effects on computation. That's not what I'm going to talk about today. I'm looking at a very basic mechanism, and that is simply the generation of action potentials. So it's really just these, these pulses, how are they created? They're all and non. And Although they all look the same, there are differences between them, and that influences network behavior. Can you actually see the pointer? Is it strong enough? Or show? Sure. Okay, perfect. So the question is, how can action potential dynamics play a role for network behavior? And let me guide you step by step through our thoughts on this. I'll start with a model system that you're all familiar with, the Hodgkin-Huxley model, which was um, developed and yeah, investigated 70 years from now, 70 years ago, um, by Hodgkin and Huxley. Um, and this formalism is still the one that we apply these days to understand these intrinsic properties of voltage dynamics. It consists of a current balance equation and is then usually paired with the dynamics of the ion channel gates, N, H, and M in this case here. But of course, there are many, many more parameters out there. So we do have ion channels, membrane capacitance, pumps, morphology, and we have external modulators. So pH can change, temperature can change, energy levels can change. And all these different parameters can be integrated in these models, and they give rise to what Christoph Koch, 99, in his book called Action Potentials of the World. So a whole variety, a whole zoo of action potentials. If you look at these action potentials from a computational point of view, then you can actually classify them into three different classes. And let me mention that I'm talking here about all or non-action potentials, so the ones with a full-blown amplitude, and, um, and the ones that we have in regularly firing cells. So I'm not talking here about deterministic bursters. And for that, we have three types. The type one with a saddle node invariant cycle bifurcation. That's the mathematical bifurcation that is associated. We have the type two. That's with a subcritical hop and a fold of limit cycle bifurcation for the limit cycle onset. And we have the homoclinic. Actually, we don't need this bar here in the middle, but never mind. And so we have the homoclinic action potentials, which arise from a saddle homoclinic, homoclinic orbit bifurcation. These two, the first ones, have been investigated quite well. The red one, the homoclinic, is a bit more exotic, although people have also looked at that before. Now, why are these first two better known? Of course, I can't tell you for sure, but um, most likely it's because Hodgkin already in 1948 described these different classes. He called it class one excitability and class two excitability. And you see that 
the major distinction or difference between the two is that if you look at the firing rate curve, so the FI curve, the input current versus firing rate, that then we have a smooth onset here of this curve for the class one excitability, and we have a jump at threshold for the class two excitability. Now the homoclinic is somewhat different. It's neither class one or class two, or rather it's both. Because for the homoclinic, it really matters in which way you measure it. When you increase the input current, this yellow line here, then you see the jump, so then it's more class two. But when you come from the other side and you decrease the input current, you can reach arbitrarily low frequencies, so it's more like class one. <coughs> Actually, this is not the most important distinction between them, but it's probably one of the reasons why the homoclinic has received less attention. Let's look a bit more into, into the details of their face plane in this case. So you know when you're doing the systems analysis, you can plot, for example, the variables here, so the voltage and the gating variable n in one plane. And what all three bifurcations or all three types have in common, they have a limit cycle. Now it's getting really weir, uh, weak, isn't it, with the pointer? Shall I use a different one? Ah, not much better. The batteries were changed just before. I'll, I'll try. Okay, so we have a limit cycle here for, for all three of them. What is different is the other fixed points or the other attractors that are around. We have the saddle node here on the left one. Um, above threshold, we have this um, unstable focus here. And for the homoclinic, we actually have the limit cycle and a stable fixed point which coexist. And that gives rise to this behavior here, which you can see if there's a little bit of noise in these cells for the homoclinic, then it will sometimes stay close to the rest state, sometimes it will be on this limit cycle trajectory, and this is why you can have this burst-like behavior, but actually it's stochastic bursting, and if there was no noise, then you would just regularly remain on the limit cycle all the time, if you start in the vicinity of the limit cycle. Okay, so how can action potential dynamics play a role for network behavior. We're getting slowly towards the question I want to, to lead you to. For that, we need to look at one crucial property of cells shaped by the action potential generation mechanism, and that is the so-called phase response curves, PRCs. So I'm sure many of you have heard about it, but I'm sure also that not everyone has, so let me briefly introduce you to this. A phase response curve basically characterizes the temporal sensitivity of a neuron to perturbations. So if you think of, you have a cell in gray here that's an action potential that fires another regular action potential, and now you give a short perturbation, it's maybe a very short pulse, at a specific phase in this firing cycle. What will happen is it will change most likely the timing of the next action potential. And the strength of this change, so how much does the next action potential move forward or um, is delayed, that is captured in the phase response curve. So here you have um, zero and one, that's when in the unperturbed system the spike is fired, and then you see, depending on where the perturbing pulse occurs, what is the change on the timing of the next spike. And this is a crucial characteristic that we need for synchronization when we consider synchronization of networks. So if we want to talk about the coupling or the, the synchronization in networks, we need a coupling function, which you see here on the left, and the coupling function has as an ingredient, ingredient the phase response curve, but also the synaptic input current. So we have both the connectivity in terms of the synaptic input and the phase response curve, which is the single neuron property. And then one can look at the theory and can arrive at the statement here, which due to time I just shortened, so you have to kind of believe me here, that if you want to have in a network then, in, of, of a fully coupled network, if you then want to have constant phase relations, yeah, you, so you have to imagine when you have a synchronization, then they all fire at the same phase, and that's a constant phase relation, then what matters is the odd part of this coupling function here. So perhaps I'm gonna, uh, but I, I'm not in the mode where I can um, actually see my cursor here, right? You, you won't see the, oh no, you do. Okay, perhaps it's better if I then use this one to point it out. So here you've got the coupling function, right? And if you look at the odd part of this coupling function, that's when you can have these constant phase relations. And 
If you now make the assumption that synaptic transmission is very fast, let's think of delta spikes and very fast synaptic transmission, then we can neglect this I term here and basically we can um, then look at the symmetry or asymmetry of the phase response curve in order to assess, in order to assess synchronization. And the measure that is derived from that is the locking range. Um, so that's basically the maximum to minimum of this odd part of the coupling function. So I know this is very short and condensed, but I at least wanted to mention this, that this asymmetry, so the symmetry of or asymmetry of the PRC has a say in whether networks can synchronize or not. Okay, now let's look at the PRC of these different neurons here. And you can see that the PRC, and that's very typical for this type one, is symmetric. The PRC of the type two is asymmetric, but in a different way, it's kind of more or less flipped and it also has negative parts here, compared to the PRC of the homoclinic action potentials. So these two are asymmetric here, and the important thing is that the asymmetric ones can lead to these constant phase relationships. So that means if we compare a type one neuron here, and you, we connect in this case here, oops, sorry, 10 neurons um, of type one, and we connect in the same way, so we have the identical networks, 10 neurons of type two here, um, then you see that as a result, although everything else is the same and it's only the spike initiation mechanism and the PRC that is changed, we get synchronization for the homoclinic neurons or the homoclinic network, and we get a non-synchronized state here for the SNCC network, for this type one network. Um, you can also see this here um, down there. If you look here, the locking range, um, very small for type one, very large for the homoclinic. Now actually one has to make a difference if we now zoom into the homoclinic one, um, one has to distinguish whether the networks are excitatory or inhibitory. And let's start with inhibitory because that's what I just showed you, I just didn't mention it. For inhibitory networks, if we look at the coupling function um, up here, I'm gonna use this one again, um, then the coupling function has a fixed point. If down here is the phase difference between, let's say you have two neurons coupled, yes, and you look at the phase, you have, have the phase difference on the x-axis, then there is a fixed point around zero. So that means that a, neuro, a, net, a neural network will tend to fire in such a way that the difference between um, the spiking phases is zero. So that would be the synchronized state. So that's what you see down here. And I'm going to show you, I mentioned in the beginning, I'll have two examples. I'm going to show you the example of a warming-induced synchronization for this case. The other case is that we have excitatory networks. For excitatory networks, this um, coupling function is flipped just because the connectivity via the synaptic current still enters, so it's a, it's a version that's mirrored at, along the x-axis. And now if you look at the fixed points, there's a stable fixed point at point zero here in the middle. And that means it's not the stable one at zero. So basically here the spikes try to separate as much as possible their phases. And that results in these splayed out states. They still have constant phase relationships. So I'll try to point this out here. So you see there's constant relationships of the phases between the different neurons, but they are not at the same point in time. They're splayed out. And I'll show you an example for this one in the Drosophila motor system at the very end of the talk. Okay, now we come to the part that's still missing. So I showed you that these intrinsic properties matter for the way how neural networks synchronize, but we wanted to have the sudden switch in the onset. Uh, so a sudden onset, I mean, of, of rhythmic activity. And for that, I'm going to turn to this first example to temperature. I couldn't resist to put on um, this slide here as a small excursion. So why is temperature interesting for mammals? Um, we had also three years ago here in Lisbon a very beautiful talk by Edward Moser about grid cells and hippocampus and everything. Um, and we did great work back in the 90s, um, which was also published very well. And I find this work very exciting because he showed at the time that when animals, rats, run around here in an environment, they, of course, use their muscles for that, and their muscles produce heat. That's what you see here on the right-hand side from his paper. Um, so in this gray bar, that's minutes down here, right? In those 20 minutes where the rat is running around, you see that the temperature, that's this upper curve here, 
the temperature of the brain increases from 37 degrees here on the right hand side to 39 degrees. And when the animal's taken out of the environment and stops running, it decreases slowly again. So he could show that this is an increase by two degrees Celsius due to muscle activity. And actually, he also showed that this affects electrical activity, so the EPSP slope. At the time, it was thought that they are changed due to plasticity, but he could show that actually it's the temperature increase. So two degrees seems very small, um, but it may not in order to trigger, at least in pathological cases, some synchronization. So what we did here is we went to models of conductance-based neurons. What you see is temperature on the x-axis, and you see this locking range. So that is this um, synchronization measure of the, how able is a, a neuron to synchronize in the network. It's not yet the network synchronization. It's just the ability of the neuron to synchronize. And you can see, first of all, that you can switch here. So you switch from, if you increase the temperature, the neuron, first it starts out as a type one neuron, a SNCC neuron, and then it changes into a homoclinic neuron. And what you also see is that the synchronization ability, then that drastically increases when you approach the switch. So you can see how this is going up here. And the asymmetry change of the PRC affects the synchronization ability because that's what underlies this change. Now, if you look at it in time, space, voltage, or local field potential rather here as a function of time, then you see this um, figure that, which I brought up very early in the talk. And you see here what we did is now this switch, which I didn't give a name at the beginning, is actually a simple increase of temperature by two degrees Celsius. And you see that this elevation of temperature is the cause for these large scale oscillations. So small temperature changes suffice to induce strong changes in synchronization. This is work by Janina Hesse, a former PhD student in my lab. And what Janina also did is, of course, she checked that this is not just a model idiosyncrasy, so that this is not just happening in one particular model. And here you see um, three simulations for higher dimensional models, so a two-dimensional sodium-potassium model, a three-dimensional Wangujaki model, and a four-dimensional trap mites model. And she also has the proof, the, ma the mathematical proof for two-dimensional systems um, that actually whenever you start out as type one and you increase temperature, you're bound to switch. So you're bound to, to have this, um, yeah, this point where if you elevate temperature further, you turn into a home neuron. Um, so you see this here that it's possible for all of them. What you should mind is sometimes this required temperature increase can be very large. It can be so large that actually in nature, all your proteins would denaturalize and then um, the cell wouldn't be there anymore. So that doesn't mean that each and every cell can do it, but in theory, in the model, um, you can in principle evoke that. Okay, so that's interesting that you can use temperature changes to induce these homoclinic ones, but is the experimental evidence. Let's ask a few more questions here. Is, is there experimental evidence for um, such behavior? And of course, we can't fully prove it, but I'll try to show you some hallmarks which we have. Um, for that, I need to guide you through this bifurcation diagram here. Um, I prefer the big screen. Sorry, it's so small on this one, but um, I think it's better for you all if I use this one here. So for what, we ha what we have here is the bifurcation diagram. So basically, you have an input current on the x-axis, and you've got temperature on the y-axis, and then you see how the system behavior changes dynamically. Down here at the lower temperature, we're SNCC, so we start out at low input currents when we are subthreshold, then we reach threshold, and then there's regular firing according to this type one dynamics. But up here where the temperature is larger, let me go here, for example, then if we increase the input, we reach threshold, but we come into a bistable zone. I mentioned this at the beginning. Um, and in this bistable zone, we have this um, stochastic bursting, which we already saw before. So and that is what you can use. It's a simple measure to detect these homoclinic action potentials. So you see here in the model on the right-hand side, this um, trace of a regularly firing neuron in the presence of a bit of noise. And if you then turn this neuron into a homoclinic spiker, you start to see these, these firing pauses, this intermittently interrupted firing mode. And that's what we would predict for a temperature increase if a temperature increase actually make, makes a neuron homoclinic. Now what Janina did is she teamed up with the lab of Dietmar Schmitz and his postdoc Nikolaus Meyer, 
and she recorded together with them CE1 pyramidal cells. Um, and she had them at a lower temperature and at a higher temperature. And you can see up here, that's the simulation. And down here, that's the experiment. And you really see that in the experiment, we start to see these gaps. So I have to say, we consider ourselves very fortunate that in the first cell type that we picked, we could observe that. We observed it in about one third of cells. So not all cells would show this transition, but the ones who did, you can see here the statistics, um, it's very significant. And we found this is a nice indication that actually homoclinic firing may occur. What Janina, what Janina also did is she tried to measure phase response curves. That's the more direct measure, but everyone who's tried that knows it's, it's really difficult to measure these phase response curves. So we were successful in four cells at two different temperatures with the high significance levels so that we can claim that there is a difference. Um, and actually in two of those fours, we also saw the switch of the PRC. So that roughly matches, but statistics N equals four are worse than for this intermittently interrupted firing mode where we have way more than 30 cells. Okay, the next question one can still ask for this example is, what are relevant parameters beyond temperature? So is temperature the only thing that can give us these um, homoclinic spikes or are there other parameters? And just gonna show you three examples on that one. The first one is one that's also been implicated in epileptic seizures. So we know that for seizures, often extracellular potassium is increased. So that was an interesting parameter and it's work here of Susanna Contreras in my lab. And what Susanna did is here you see this bifurcation diagram. This is why it was also worth to point it out to you in more detail. And she found that if you take extracellular potassium as a switching parameter, the bifurcation diagram is very similar. So you also start out here in this type one and then you get this by stability and eventually it's ended by depolarization block. But it's the very same um, the critical structure that you see for extracellular potassium and that you see for the temperature diagram. So that means that at elevated extracellular potassium levels, we also expect these firing pauses. And um, Susanna, I have to say, was able at a poster at a conference like this to find an experimenter, um, Alan Gullich, who found that interesting enough that he went ahead. So he's from Dartmouth College in, um, in the US and he in slices recorded um, cells, pyramidal cells at the lower potassium levels and at elevated potassium levels, which are kind of pathological. And he also observed these firing gaps. So we have an indication that also in these cells we can observe the switch. The second parameter that's interesting, and now I'm coming back to something I mentioned initially, is the change in pH. So I'm coming back to the febrile seizures, where I mentioned that it's not only the increase in temperature that plays a role, but also pH is involved, and nobody knows really why. Now what we did, and that's, I admit that's a very rough way of doing it, um, Janina went ahead and implemented the pH change as a change to a sodium channel. And you change um, the activation and deactivation voltage dependencies. It's all according to experimental studies, so we didn't make that up. We went to the best studies we could find there, and um, where people also say that this is the most crucial change that you observe with pH. She inserted that in the model and simply analyzed what happens. And you can see that, okay, going to go back here, um, that if this is the, the transition, the original one, if you now increase the pH, so you have an alkalosis, then this transition temperature decreases. So the transition occurs earlier, earlier in terms of at the lower temperature. And that explains why, this, why, why temperature plays a role. So actually clinical tests in, in real patients have shown that lowering the pH can stop a seizure. And at least in this model explanation that we offer here, it would be that alkalosis moves the transition to lower temperatures and that this is the reason why a seizure would stop. I'm not claiming that we have here the full model of febrile seizures, don't misunderstand me, but I find it interesting that um, at least this model offers an explanation for how pH may come into play here. Okay, and the final other parameter that may influence the homoclinic um, action potentials and favor them is we looked at morphology because leak can also play a role. And if you have large dendrites, you have an extra leak load to the cells. So this is now work of Robert Garris in my lab. What Robert did is here, he illustrates this um, with a neuron whose dendrites he increases, right? So he modeled these um, anatomically detailed neurons and you can see the corresponding PRCs. And if the dendrites are very small, you get this symmetric type one PRC. Then if you increase it, you come to a HOM action potential, 
um, firing only due to this change in morphology, and eventually, if you increase it further, you end up at type two. Now, what you can then do is you can ask yourself, does that also, is that also visible in the network? And so what Robert did here is he used the type one, sorry, this should be type one, but it's the saddle node invariant psychobifurcation SNCC, and the effect of PRC, so basically the action potential generating equations, they are the same this time, so they're identical. The only thing that matters is you have an extra dendrite, and this extra dendrite leads to a different PRC of the neuron. You have a symmetrical one in this blue network, and you have a HOM one, a homoclinic one here in the second network with larger dendrites, and you see the network synchronizes in the second case, and it doesn't synchronize in this first case. So that's very consistent with the theory we had before. Okay, we're almost through, but I want to at the very end show you very briefly the Drosophila example, and then I'm going to summarize what we saw here. So for Drosophila, we now have a functionally relevant context how to produce play states with these homoclinic action potentials. So as you all know, Drosophila flies. It's an asynchronous flyer, and I'm not an expert in all the things that are going on there, but I know that you need a muscle to actually get the wing down. And we're talking about how this muscle operate, is operated to get the wing down. And for that, we have this motor network MN125. And you see we, here where I only concentrate on four of these neurons because they're on one side. And for simplicity, that's the scheme of this network. So you have four neurons. And they're all, and that's really important, electrically coupled. They also have some chemical synapses, but our experimental, experimental collaborators found that they're very weak. So the predominant coupling here is the electrical one. What has been known since the 1970s is that if you record from these neurons, they show this really nice play state. So you have constant phase rela relationships, um, but the phase is not identical across neurons. Why is that useful for Drosophila? The idea is that this they helps to stabilize mus muscle tension. So if you look at this example here, this played out state down here in green, then actually um, if you look at the if net effect on the muscle, because you get inputs all through the time, so to speak, um, then you have this more or less stable, constant muscle tension. Whereas if they would synchronize and fire all at the same time, you'd get elevations and then the muscle tension would not be as stable, not as constant across time. But the question now is how to get these play states. And what Nelson Niemeyer, in, a PhD student in my lab, did in collaboration with the lab of Carsten Duch in Mainz um, and Stefan Jureglewski, um, he analyzed data of this and he did modeling. And for the modeling, that's what you see here. He took a model that existed, the Berger and Crook model, and he saw that if he changes one potassium conductance in there, the SHAP potassium conductance, then he can actually make this action potential type of the model switch. So if you have high concentration of SHAP, then you actually have a type two. Yeah, you see the phase response curve here. If you have a medium SHAP, then it's type one. And for actually realistic SHAP levels that more or less correspond to the experimental ones, you have this homoclinic phase response curve, so homoclinic action potentials. If you now take into account that we have coupling via electrical synapses and they are non-rectifying electrical synapses, then you can look at what happens, what do you predict for synchronization in this network. And you predict actually here a fixed point at zero, so that means in-phase synchronization, for type two, you predict in-phase synchronization for type one, and you predict this played out state for the homoclinic one. And you can see this here if you look at the network simulations, so for weak gap junction coupling and homoclinic spikes, you get these play states, and that's very similar to what we observe experimentally. If you take a SNCC network, um, then the splayness of the network, there's an index for that or a measure for that, is very low. One last point in this talk and on that subject. What I didn't mention so far is we're talking about a weak coupling regime. Weak, weak coupling doesn't mean um, that it's so weak that it doesn't play a role in reality. Weak just means it's not so strong that 
you synchronize everything. Because no matter what your action potential type is, if your connectivity is so strong that you know, an input already elicits the next spike, then everything um, will be different. So we're talking in, in about this intermediate range, which we think is the one that's relevant most of the time in the brain. For Drosophila, what, we, what one can do and what Karsten did is you can overexpress the inexines that are responsible for these gap junctions, and you can see what happens then to this network state. And that's what they did. You see, I'll start with the experimental part. That's what you see here on the right-hand side. So if you have the normal gap junctions, you see that the wing beat frequency, in that case, that was the measure here, it fluctuates a bit, but it's more or less constant. It's this green curve. Whereas if you now overexpress, then you assume that the network will synchronize, no matter the action potential type that underlies it. And they actually observed here that you then get these large fluctuations here, which are not desired in wing beat frequency. And we see the same in models. Actually, the way we did it was the other way around. We first did the model, and then they did the experiment. So perhaps I should have rephrased it um, in the other order. Um, but if you look at it in the model, then if you increase the strength of electrical coupling, you see that you have a high um, occurrence of these play states. That these gr that's these gre green curves here, and that's the play index here. So basically, um, yeah, you observe a lot of play states. And then at a certain point, it breaks down and the synchronization comes up and it becomes more of a synchronized state. And there's more complicated ones in the middle, but that's just something to mention. So you see that the model here also very nicely agrees with the experiment in this prediction. So gap junctions are essential in this case for splayed out network states, which, which some people call desynchronized states, right? Because they don't have this firing all at the same phase. Um, so it's an example where gap junctions help to desynchronize. But if you overexpress them too much, um, then this breaks down and display state is destroyed. Okay, so let me summarize this long talk. So action, I hope that's the, that's the main message that I have. I hope I got that across. Action potential dynamics can set network states. So it's not an illusion. I know we all ignore it most of the time when we, do, when we work with networks, but they can do this. Um, homoclinic spikes are particularly interesting for several reasons. One is that they're inducible by many physiological parameters, and the other one because they result in synchronized or splayed out network states, depending on whether it's inhibitory or excitatory networks. That's what I showed you today. At the transition from the type one to the homoclinic, we can have this sudden onset, which we would not expect at any other transition. Of course, there are also other transitions that occur, but it's this transition in particular that has the switch in the PRC asymmetry, and therefore can give rise to these sudden onsets. And I also showed you some experimental evidence, initial experimental evidence that homoclinic spikes may exist in the brain, and we discussed some functional relevance. So splayed out states in central pattern generators, particularly in small ones for insects, um, but potentially homoclinic spikes may also be involved in seizures and in network oscillation onsets in mammals. There's a number of open questions which may be interesting, so just let me end with that. Um, we ask, of course, ourselves, is the brain full of homo homoclinic spikes and we simply haven't seen it yet? Or don't we really find them in the brain? And if so, why? Because we would predict that they should be there because so many parameters can do the trick. Which are the trigger factors for a switch to homoclinic dynamics, like ion channel mutations may be an interesting player here? Why are some brain areas or, or cell types more prone to pathological synchronization than others? So this mechanism here may give us a clue to that, so, so these intrinsic properties may um, deliver at least a partial explanation. And last but not least, I haven't mentioned that before, can we unintentionally induce homoclinic dynamics with modern simulation techniques like optogenetics? Because if we have a laser that you know, stimulates the tissue, it also heats the tissue, and if that changes the dynamics, then what we observe may not be pure nature, but um, may also in part be an experimental artifact. Okay, so I thank you for your attention and the people who have done the work. Um, you see here the people from my lab, Jan Hendrik, Robert, Janina, Susanna, and Nelson, and our experimental collaborators, um, here Dietmar Schmitz, Nikolaus Meyer, Alan Gullich, Carsten Duch und Mainz, and Stefanie Ryglewski for the Drosophila story. And I also thank the lab, it's a fantastic lab. It has not been easy, like I guess for most labs in the last two years, um, but it's really, really great 
to work with these people. I thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions. for that wonderful talk. And um, just a quick uh, order of business before we proceed to the questions. Can the um, speaker for the next talk please identify yourself if you're here? And um, yes, okay, can you please come and uh, um, connect up with the AV person, thank you. Um, okay, do we have any questions from the app? Are there questions over there? Yeah, please Sorry. go ahead. Um, uh, Victor Buendia from the University of Tübingen. It was a very nice talk. I would be interested to know because uh, you have focused a lot on the bifurcations on the individual unit, but uh, if I couple, for example, a uh, normal form of a bifurcation, like a Hopf bifurcation, which is uh, type two, and I couple many of them, uh, still the macroscopic state of this can display different dynamical regimes. And it is not obvious uh, from the very first moment, which is going to be the macroscopic dynamical regime from all this, uh, from all this coupling. So I wonder if uh, uh, you have studied which are the possibilities once you couple all these homoclinic neurons, which kind of uh, dynamical states you can get at the large scale, and how are they different from the things that you obtain from the hope for the SNIC or things like that? Okay. So we <coughs> So I'm not sure, uh, you, you helped me with your question, I'm not sure I understood it correctly. So we, when, we, when we put several homoclinic neurons in the network, so we, we can analyze the full network, right? So you're not asking about having many of them, but you're asking about, um, could, could, you just, could you just help me? I'm not sure I got the point. Um, I'm asking about uh, the dynamical uh, behavior of the whole system. Like mm -hmm. uh, uh, you can have, uh, after coupling all these units, uh, maybe different phases and bifurcation between these phases in order parameters that are, for example, average firing rate of the whole, new, of, of the whole network. So, and uh, just coupling a, a normal form of this, uh, of this hub, for example, does not mean that the whole system is gonna be in, in, in a bifurcation. So I wonder if, uh, if uh, you know, uh, if you have an idea of uh, which are the possible dynamical regimes that ha can emerge when you couple many of these homocleaving neurons. Okay, so, I'm still not, I'm sorry for this. It's after the talk, one is a little bit brain, brain dead, I heard. Um, this may be true. Um, so, so, we can go to, so we can go to the networks. We have, we have all these different homoclinic neurons and we can couple them and then we can predict the network behavior. But that's not your point, right? So. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's, that's the point. So okay, but, but that's, that's what we're doing here. So we have, so we have, we are not, in the first part, I talked about the, the bifurcations of the individual neuron, units, but then you can go to the network and predict the whole network behavior. What I did, I only explored that here in the, in the terms of the bifurcation. So I didn't tell you the network um, dynamics as such of this or that bifurcation. Yeah, so, so that we have not um, really looked into, but what we were interested in is the synchronizing state. And, and that is really the one for the network that changes, for the whole network. So if you have, so you can really say that for a Hopf network, you can, depending on, on the synaptic coupling, you can um, get synchronization or not synchronization, right? And the same for homoclinic. Um, but I'm not, I'm not sure, I'm sorry if I, if I addressed the question. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Let's take one more question from this side and then uh, we'll have to move on to the next presentation. Okay. Thank you for the talk. Um, you mentioned networks of excitatory neurons and networks of inhibitory neurons. Can you say something about ne mixed networks? Yes, I'm, I'm prepared for that question, although I don't have a satisfying answer yet. Um, so that's more complicated because there's so many, so many parameters that you can have, right? It's, it's a different degree of complexity. So what we started to do is we started to look at mixed balance type of networks. And um, what we see for sure is that this homoclinic um, behavior or the homoclinic property matters and it translates into the network behavior in terms of introducing lower frequencies to the network. Yeah, so you, you definitely start to see an elevation in all these cases, be it temperature or extracellular potassium increases, that you get more power in the higher, in, sorry, in the low frequencies. 
Um, but the mechanism behind that and what our suspicion is, but I don't know yet, right? So I'm guessing here is that if, that depending on the network structure, you could have a partial synchronization of the inhibitory network, which then, you know, feeds back on the excitatory and then introduces these dynamics, but it's too early to say. So, so we're looking into this. Yeah, what I can tell you perhaps for the robustness is that you don't need an all-to-all -all coupled network. So for the pure ones, you can reduce connectivity and you can also reduce the number of neurons that are that turn into homoclinic spikers, and you still see this, this drastic increase. It's a little bit milder, but um, so, so for networks that are not completely balanced, where you introduce only, um, let's say, a few inhibitory neurons, I would suspect that there you still definitely see it, but in the fully balanced case where that really needs to, to a synchronization, um, that needs to be seen. Yeah. Okay. Let's thank Dr. Schreiber for a really wonderful talk. While our next speaker is getting set up, just a couple of, of comments. Um, first of all, um, if you didn't get a chance to ask your question of Dr. Schreiber, uh, you can um, perhaps try to find her at the reception, uh, or you can also put your question in the Whova app, and uh, hopefully she'll be able to answer it later. Um, second thing is uh, just a reminder, everyone should be wearing a mask in this room, unless you are uh, actually the speaker. Um, or uh, spe actively speaking here uh, up at the front. Um, so um, with that, let me just check in to see if our next speaker is ready. So our next okay. talk is um, by Shiva Lindy. Um, it's entitled Basal Ganglia Feedback Loops Generate Beta Oscillations. Thank you. Thank you. It's really hard to follow that fantastic talk, isn't it? <laughs> OK, so um, I'm going to talk about how basal ganglia feedback loops generate, basal, um, generate oscillations. And And for that, let's have a quick overview. Uh, as many of you probably know, the basal ganglia are a set of subcortical nuclei that are involved in motor control, such as action selection and procedural learning. They receive from input from the cortex, then the information is processed within the basal ganglia, and then projected to the output structure, the SNR, and from there it's back propagated to the cortex. The striatum, the input structure, receives dopaminergic input from the substantia nigra pars compacta. And Parkinson's disease actually happens when you have the degeneration of these dopaminergic cells. And these patients present with rigidity, bradykinesia of movement, and beta oscillations in the basal ganglia circuitry. And the beta oscillations themselves are those who have um, frequencies between 12 to 30 hertz. And here I show you an example of the recordings in a Parkinson's patient. Uh, we have the subthalamic nucleus unit recordings, as well as the uh, local food potentials, and you can see these bursts of activity with a beta band frequency. So we want to dissect what is generating beta oscillations in the basal ganglia, but before that, we need to know how oscillations can emerge. So it is generally understood that if you add a negative feedback loop to a neural population, you make it possible for this network to exhibit oscillatory behavior. And there are numerous closed negative feedback loops within the basal ganglia structure. So the question here is, which feedback loops are actually important and crucial for the beta oscillations to emerge? And to answer this question, we rely on experiments. So there is this recent work by the group of Mele where they record um, in Parkinsonian rats, and they try to opt to inhibit the globus pallidus external at population level. And what they see is that they are able to get rid of oscillations at the level of cortex and SCN. So what this means is that the GPE here is actually necessary for beta oscillations to emerge. So now we're going to look for any close negative feedback loop in the basal ganglia that actually in, includes the GPE, which is crucial. And first off, we have the classical subthalamic nucleus and globus pallidus external recurrent network that was um, 
previously suggested in the late 90s that is a candidate to explain the origins of beta oscillations. And since then, there have been numerous computational studies trying to replicate what, what we see uh, in the experiments. On the right, you can see an example of the Bogash group where they uh, replicate oscillations in these two nuclei. But now, we know that the Gobos pallidus is itself consisting of two subpopulations, the prototypical neurons and the archipallidal cells. We also have experimental evidence that they backpropagate to the striatum, which itself has some heterogeneity inside, making it possible to have a closed negative feedback loop between the striatum and the globus pallidus. There's also another closed negative feedback loop, including the archipallidal cells. Here we call them the archi loop. And we also know that there is a lateral inhibition within the prototypical subpopulation itself. So now that we have all these um, loops introduced, we want to know how these uh, loops are individually or a combination of them can generate beta oscillations. And for that, we start off um, by simulating 100 neurons in each of these colored subpopulations using a RAID model. Imagine that we have a neuron eye in a presynaptic population here that is sending projection to a postsynaptic population beta. And the output of this neuron is governed by a low-pass filtered version of the input that it receives, and it has a time scale of tau. The input that is, um, this, in, the, this neuron is receiving is a sum of all the converging synapses to it, each of them having a gain of G or strength of G and a transmission delay of delta. And these transmission delays within the network are all extracted from experimental works on rat data. Now, let's take a look at what the results show. She, here I show you the uh, results of the FSI loop, but it can be generalized. And here I show the average firing rate of each of these um, subpopulations in a rest state, moving on to a, like a shaded area, which is the activated state. And here I increase the strength of this loop and show you the amplitude ratio of the last cycle to the first. And now I start strengthening the connections in, within the loop. And you can see that we start having some transient oscillations that for a strong enough G converge to a stable oscillation. So showing that increasing the gain actually pushes the network to the oscillatory regime. And the frequency of this uh, oscillations in this state are um, dependent on the time scales within the system. So we decide to fix the time scale of excitation and vary the time scale of inhibition within each individual loop separately and look at the frequency of the stable oscillations. And what we see is that we have two pallidostriator loops, the FSI and the Archi loop, on the lower bound of beta, and the other two loops are generating higher frequencies than this range. What this means is that the classical SDN uh, globus pallidus network is probably not uh, generating beta oscillations within the basal ganglia synchrotry alone. However, the RAID model is only having one time constant. So we decided to look at it through a spiking neural network where we are segregating the synaptic integration from the membrane uh, time constant. And for that, we use a leaky integrate and fire neuron, which I probably most of you are familiar with uh, from the last talk, and the, where the membrane potential increases up to a threshold, and then the spike is discharged, the potential is reset, and so on and so forth. So we extract whatever we can, almost all of the parameters in the network from the experimental in rat data. And on top of that, we tune the fine rate distributions to those uh, that we get from the experiments. Here you can see the example of the prototypical neurons and the SCN neurons. So the results of the spiky neural network uh, with a constraint, like parameter constraint, shows that we, we have consistent uh, results similar to the RAID model. We have that these two pallidostriator loops on the lower bound of beta, and the shaded area is beta, and the other two loops are generating higher frequencies. So this means that the individual loops are not generating experimentally observed beta frequency. But later on, I'm going to show that when you add all of the loops together, these frequencies are going to come closer together 
residing in the beta in the experimentally observed range. And note that all of these networks are actually having high enough gain that are pushed to the oscillatory regime. And I'm going to talk about how we transition from a healthy state where we have no oscillations to a dopamine depleted state or Parkinsonian state where we see the, these pathological beta oscillations. So I add all of the networks together in a healthy state and here you can see in the raster plot of the 40 neurons out of 1,000 in each subpopulation that we have asynchronous firing. This is due to having low gain because they're not in the, the oscillatory regime yet. But now we have evidence from experiments that the proto to SDN and the FSI to D2 strengthen their projection gain after the brain is depleted of dopamine, meaning that the gain of the FSI loop and the gain of the uh, SCN loop are actually increased. Applying these structural changes and adding the firing rates to those of the dopamine depleted state, we shift to a synchronous oscillatory regime where we have synchronous spikes in almost all of the subpopulation, as you can see. This is also evident when we look at and compare the firing rate um, time courses of the healthy data to those of the dopamine depleted state. And here on the bottom, you can see that we have no significant oscillations in the rest state, whereas in the same scale, we have a significant peak in the experimentally observed um, beta range for the dopamine depleted state. So, we, we have access to the data of uh, phase histograms of single um, neuron spikes relative to their recorded EEG in uh, Parkinsonian rats from the group of um, McGill and group of Mele uh, in these four subpopulations. So this gives us the chance to compare these phase relationships for, to those we get from our experiments. And what we see here is that we have um, Contrary to the SCNGP alone circuit, our phase relationships are actually aligned with those of the experiments. But here we're missing the recordings of the fast spiking interneurons in the striatum in the Parkinsonian state. So we now propose this phase relationship that can be uh, matched to future experiments that are performed in beta oscillations. And with that, I want to conclude that following dopamine depletion in the brain, the palidostriatal loops together for this CNGP can generate beta oscillations. And I would like to thank uh, my team, my supervisor Arthur and Nico and Jérôme, and thank you all for your attention. I would be happy to take any questions. Let's start on this side this time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dave Reddish, Minnesota. Thank you for that excellent talk. Um, have you tried applying this uh, technique and this kind of analysis to the other uh, healthy um, uh, oscillations known to exist in striatum? Does this same, can you expand the space of your model to take into account things like gamma 50 and things like that and gamma 80 oscillations? If, also yeah. as a follow up, have you looked at how this changes across the striatum and the different aspects from dorsal to ventral and medial to lateral? Uh, very good question. If you give me, if you provide me with the electrophysiological data of uh, specific cells, I can generate, uh, like I can model that. It's, it's, it's just a model that you can, you need to input the uh, biologically plausible constant to it, which is really hard to extract from the experimental work because this, huge variability between work to work and um, yeah, basically that. But from the, uh, about the striatum, I think my work, I focused on the dorsal lateral because it's involved in the motor control. But uh, of course, if, if I follow up on the literature, experimental literature and find out uh, how it's different in the ventral, I can follow up with that, yeah, of course. Sorry, one, one other quick follow up. Your, um, when you took into account the how time constants for synapse and for um, membrane, did you also take the um, transition time constant? The, the, the uh, you know, because your first model had a, had a time yeah. transition, so that's also in the third one? Yes, of course, yeah. Thank you. Over there. Hi. Uh, Hi. Thanks for your talk. I was curious, uh, 
if you choose different synaptic delays between your different spiking neurons, how would that uh, affect your result? Or how, how did, did you choose the synaptic delays? Okay, so I'm going to, um, this is, So the, the I, what I have is what I extracted from the literature, and it includes the mean value, the range, and the variability, which I introduce as a heterogeneity between my cells. And I also have noise that ha introduces uh, different heterogeneities, as well as having a Gaussian distributed uh, external input that is fed to each network. So. I try to include as much heterogeneity that there is in experiments and the real brain. Does that answer your question? Yeah, maybe I didn't get it. So you have a decay time constant? But I have decay. There are also delay, delays, right? Synaptic yeah, delays. I have the trans axonal transmission delay. Ah, and that, then when it gets, yeah, it gets to the synapse, it has a, a rise time constant, yeah. decay time constant, and a membrane time constant in the uh, postsynaptic uh, neuron. Okay, thanks. All right, I think we need to move on. Thank you very much for a really interesting talk. <laughs> and our next speaker, speaker will be Jacob Ratliff, um, who will be speaking on neocortical long-range inhibitory neurons coordinate state-dependent network synchronization. All right, uh, thank you everybody for coming. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, I'm excited to tell you about this work that I've been, been uh, doing for the past few years on this unique cell population of long-range inhibitory neurons and um, how they coordinate state-dependent network synchronization. So there are two important themes in this talk. The first one is the regulation of behavioral states. As you might be able to guess from this picture, the, the most important or one of the most dramatic examples of different behavioral states is the difference between sleep and wake, which has profound impacts on both the behavior of an animal and brain activity. The second important theme is the diversity of inhibitory neurons in the neocortex. Um, we've known since the time of Ramoni Cajal uh, that uh, inhibitory neurons come in many different shapes and sizes, um, and we're interested in exploring that. Um, we've made a lot of progress in the last few years, um, understanding the, the diversity of inhibitory neurons, largely through work with single-cell RNA sequencing. Here I'm showing you a plot of the transcriptomic diversity of inhibitory neurons. Um, in particular, I'm, I'm interested in focusing on a population of inhibitory neurons that are very genetically unique. They're defined by the co-expression of, of uh, two markers, somatostatin and neuronal nitric oxide synthase. Um, these neurons are um, really genetically, genetically distinct. They're also highly, highly evolutionarily conserved. We can uh, see them all the way from reptiles into humans. Uh, and we think that uh, because they're evolutionarily concerned, they conserved, they have an important function. They're also highly morphologically distinct. If you look at a reconstruction of one of these somatostatin end NOS cells, these are the long-range inhibitory neurons from the title of my talk. If you compare them to a canonical somatostatin-expressing inhibitory neuron, the Martinotti cell, you see that they're really, really morphologically distinct. When we began this project, we needed a way to target these cells, so we turned to a class of inter intersectional genetic tools. These tools express at the intersection of uh, Cree recombinase and FLIP recombinase, so only in cells that express these two proteins can, will we express a tool. We combine this with two mouse lines, the somatostatin flip mouse line and the nnos cre -ER mouse line to yield cell type specific expression in our long range inhibitory neurons. We choose the lens of, of behavioral state to understand the function of these cells. Um, I'm showing you one particular way of measuring behavioral state here um, that is using uh, pupil diameter. When an animal is in a quiet, less aroused state, the pupil is constricted. But as the animal becomes more alert, the pupil, the pupil dilates. This correlates with a lot of different measures of behavioral states, such as facial movement and locomotion. It also correlates with profound changes in brain activity. In, the, in this quiet, less around state, brain activity is dominated by synchronized local field potentials and spiking activity, 
whereas in the alert state, cortical networks are much more desynchronized. The reason we choose this lens is based on some work that had been done before we, before we began this project. Uh, this work suggested that the activity of these cells is uh, state dependent. In particular, this group looked for um, a histological marker of activity FOSS and when it co-localized with our somatostatin and NOS cells. Um, and in particular, this marker of activity co-localized in sleeping animals but not in awake animals. Uh, this gave us a, a good hint that these cells are, are state dependent in their activity, but it really doesn't give us any fine time scale detail of when, they, when exactly they might be active or how active they are in these, in these different states. So in order to, to gain a little bit more insight into this question, we, um, we turned to calcium imaging to record the activity of these somatostatin and NOS cells. We have a genetic strategy that allows us to not only target the somatostatin and NOS cells, but also to target other somatostatin cells and image them simultaneously. When we image these cells, we also measure multiple features of state, including locomotion, facial movement, and, and LFP. We also measure EMG and, and uh, pupil size. Um, when we look at particular, particular times when these somatostatin and NOS cells are active, uh, when these cells are active, which I've labeled here with these red bars, um, the animal is in a low arousal state with low locomotion, low facial movement, low EMG. Um, and if we, look in the, if we look in the local field potentials, anytime one of these, one of these somatostatin and NOS cells is active, we also see an increase in this low frequency band of the local field potential. If you look down here in the spectrogram, uh, in the low frequency band, at any red peak that you see here, it almost always corresponds to a peak in activity in the somatostatin and NOS cells. If you look at the other somatostatin cells, they, they display different, different uh, activity characteristics. They're more likely to be active during periods of high, high arousal with high locomotion, high facial movement. Um, if we look at this a little bit more quantitatively and divide these recordings into periods where somatostatin and NOS cells are active versus inactive, we can see that these somatostatin and NOS cells are, um, are active during periods of low arousal with low facial movement, low EMG, and low locomotion. If we look at what happens in the local field potentials, when these somatostatin and NOS cells are active, there's an increase in um, low frequency power, i.e. network synchronization. Um, if we look at what happens when other somatostatin cells are active, it's the, the opposite trend show. These other somatostatin cells are active during periods of high arousal, high facial movement, high EMG, high locomotion, and increased network desynchronization. We wanted to test to see whether this correlation between somatostatin and NOS cell and network synchronization was causal in some way. To do this, we turned to optogenetics. We expressed a channel rhodopsin specifically in our somatostatin and NOS cells. We stimulated these cells using a variety of different, of different uh, protocols, using uh, rectangular pulses, sinusoidal pulses, white noise stimuli. We did this simultaneously with performing uh, dense electrocellular, extracellular electrophysiology using uh, silicon linear probes that are physically coupled to taper, tapered optical fibers, allowing us to stimulate a, a and record across all cortical layers. We first look at looked at what happened to local field potentials when we stimulated these cells. We found that particularly in deep layers, we're able to increase power in low frequencies when we stimulate these somatostatin and NOS cells. Um, if we look, this is one particular type of stimulation that I'm showing you, a flat pulse. Um, but if we look across many different, different types of stimuli that I used, um, each, with, with each uh, type of stimulation of these uh, long range inhibitory neurons, we're able to increase power in low frequencies. We also looked at what happens uh, at the changes with spiking activity when we stimulate these cells. We looked at the cross correlogram, uh, the average cross correlogram of all the spiking pairs that we, that we recorded in these experiments with and without optogenetic stimulation. Uh, we found that when we stimulate these cells, we increase uh, short time scale synchrony uh, between these spiking pairs. We also looked at how individual units uh, correlate with the ongoing local field potentials that we're recording. Um, we looked at the spike field coupling in, in our data with and without uh, stimulation, and we find that with optogenetic stimulation, we increase the spike field coupling, particularly in this three to six hertz band. We next wanted to test whether, these, whether this was um, unique to somatostatin and NOS cells. Uh, 
Um, to do this, we expressed a channel rhodopsin in a closely related cell type, uh, that being somatostatin positive and NOS negative cells. These are the other somatostatin cells from the imaging experiment I showed earlier. When we stimulate these cells and do a similar analysis, we see the opposite effect. When we stimulate other, somat other somatostatin cells, we see a decrease in network synchronization. So with that, I'd like to summarize what I've shown you so far. Um, so in the more alert, aroused state, somatostatin and NOS cells are, are largely inactive. This corresponds with a, a largely desynchronized network state on both local field potentials and spiking activity because our somatostatin and NOS cells are not able to act on the network. In a more quiet, less aroused state, the somatostatin and NOS cells are much more active, which corresponds to increased network synchronization because these somatostatin and NOS cells are able to act on, on the network. With optogenetics, we were able to, to activate these cells uh, and induce a more synchronized network state, uh, showing that this, that this, this, uh, the activity of these cells is causal in generating the state, which we think is something that's interesting. It suggests that the synchronized state is not, not just a default state of the cortex if you're to remove ascending, ascending activating neuromodulation, but is in fact generated with the help of these cells. In order to finish up this work, we have a few, a few more experiments that we'd like to do. We'd like to understand how these cells couple to the network. Um, in particular, we have hypotheses about, about uh, how these cells become inactive during the alert state, potentially with some inhibitory neuromodulation, and how these cells induce the synchronized state uh, based on their unique set of neuromodulators. With that, I'd like, to, I'd like to thank everybody who made this work possible. My, my lab, my mentor, Renata Batista Brito, as well as the Schulson Lab, with which, which, who we closely collaborate, as well as our formal collaborators in this project in the Tomer Lab and the Dice Roth Lab. And if you're interested in this work, you can connect with me here. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful talk. Uh, we have time for some questions. Uh, hey, uh, uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, I had a quick question about um, that difference that you showed with the optogenetics at the end. Mm -hmm. Have you tried um, looking at effects at different distances from the tapered fiber? I mean, I'm just wondering because since you're pronouncing the long range projection aspect yeah. of these cells, I'm wondering about the long range effect. No, no this is a great question. This is, this is exactly the next experiment that we want to do. So hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to tell you soon. Yes, please. Yeah, this is a this is a really good question. So it looks like it's a little bit of both. It looks like it's much easier to um, to generate a more synchronized network state when the animal is in this low arousal state. <coughs> but um, also in a in a more in a more high arousal state where the animal is moving its face more, we can generate a more synchronized network state. But it doesn't appear to be as as effective the stimulation that we do. We have a question from the app uh, by Jason Moore. Do you have any information about the postsynaptic targets of these cells? Yeah, yeah. So we're, this is something that we're definitely interested in. Um, not much is known. They do synapse onto pyramidal cells. Um, they also express this, this, neuro, or this uh, neurotransmitter nitric oxide that can influence many, many cells nearby non-synaptically. Um, but it's something that we're interested in exploring in future experiments. And there's another question from the app um, from Theoclitus amorosiotis. Apologies for my poor pronunciation. If you inactivate these neurons, would you expect the animals to remain in an aroused state? Yeah, yeah. So the um, question is about whether, they, whether they'll, they'll control a more global arousal state versus a more, a more local state. I think the way that we think about these cells is more controlling the, the local state of the cortical network.
So they, they're involved in coupling this more global arousal state to the, the local expression of, of uh, cortical synchronization or desynchronization. Thank you very much for a really interesting talk. Right, so last, but by no means least, uh, we have Leah Papadopoulos uh, from the University of Oregon. Um, she will be speaking on metastable circuit dynamics explains optimal coding of auditory stimuli at moderate arousals. Cool. Um, yeah, thank you everyone. Um, I'm Leah. Um, I'm a postdoc at the Institute of Neuroscience at the University of Oregon, where I work with Professor Luca Mazzucato. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity to talk about um, some of our recent efforts using spiking network models of metastable activity to try and explain some aspects of state dependent uh, sound processing and auditory cortex. So just to um, start with some background, we know that in order for animals to survive in natural environments, um, they have to be able to distinguish between different auditory stimuli or perhaps detect the presence of informative sounds um, that are clouded by noise. But crucially, uh, past studies have shown that in addition to stimulus properties, sound processing can be affected by an animal's behavioral state. Um, so for example, experimental work has shown that uh, both locomotion and pupil indexed arousal levels, as mentioned in the last talk, um, can both modulate auditory processing. And one result in particular that's really motivated our current work and what I'll talk about on the coming slides is this result from McGinley in 2015. Um, so in this study, the authors found that performance on um, an auditory signal detection task was best at moderate levels of arousal. So if you look at this red curve here, you can see performance peaks at intermediate pupil sizes here, and then the performance drops off um, on either side. And this finding of an optimal arousal state for auditory detection um, seems maybe more generally to be a manifestation of an idea suggested by Yerkes and Dodson more than 100 years ago. Um, in particular, they propose that for difficult tasks, performance will be impaired during both periods of low arousal, where an animal is drowsy or disengaged, um, as well as during states of very high arousal, where an animal may be anxious or easily distracted. So motivated by this general idea, and more specifically by the findings of McGinley in the context of auditory detection, um, the question that we wanted to try and address is, can we develop a biologically plausible network model that can help us understand the circuit level mechanisms mediating um, arousal dependent sound processing? So as a first step towards this goal, we analyzed a set of electrophysiological recordings from auditory cortex of passively behaving mice. And we considered the problem of frequency encoding. So in these experiments, mice were presented with pure tones of several different frequencies while they were allowed to run on a ball. And throughout tone presentation, the experimentalists recorded spiking activity from cell populations in auditory cortex. And then simultaneously, they took measurements of the animal's behavioral state. Um, so specifically, they recorded the animal's running speed and also their pupil size, which was used as a proxy for arousal level. So we'd like to examine um, how arousal modulates population coding of tone frequency in this data set. And so to do that, we first compute the average pupil size in every trial. And then we bin trials according to the percentile of their pupil size. Um, and then using the data in a given pupil size range, um, we train a linear decoder to classify tone frequency from the ensemble activity. And we repeat this um, for all of our pupil size bins, which range from small sizes to uh, large sizes. So this final plot shows the session average decoding performance as a function of pupil size. And we see that it has this uh, inverted U shape. So on average, decoding tends to be best um, for intermediate pupil sizes, suggesting that frequency discriminability may be enhanced during moderate levels of arousal. 
Okay, so we'd now like to try and build a biologically plausible model that can explain this arousal dependent frequency coding that we observe in our data set. So towards that goal, we're going to model auditory cortex as a recurrently connected network of excitatory and inhibitory spiking neurons, and uh, really heavily inspired by a number of past studies, a handful of which are shown here, um, we're gonna consider two variants of the network architecture. So first, an unstructured random architecture, which gives rise to this asynchronous irregular activity. And then second, an architecture in which neurons are arranged into strongly connected clusters, uh, representing functionally correlated neural assemblies. And as shown previously in these studies and others, networks with this type of clustered organization give rise to metastable dynamics where subsets of clusters transition between states of high and low activity across time. So the next step is to incorporate the effect of a change in arousal state. And in this model, we're going to implement that as a modulation of the network's external input. And we're again gonna consider two variants. So first, we'll just consider a simple increase in the mean external input to the excitatory cells in the network, delta ME. And then second, we'll consider uh, a perturbation that modulates the spatial variance of the external inputs, such that some cells receive more or less input relative to baseline, but the mean across the population stays fixed. And I'll denote this modulation of the spatial variance as delta SE. So given these two modulations, we first wanted to ask which one better captured the impact of movement or high arousal on spontaneous single cell spike rates in the data. So first in the model, um, a strong delta mean modulation increases the firing rate of all cells, as you might expect. Um, whereas a strong delta variance modulation will induce mixed responses, where some cells increase their rate and others decrease. If we then look at the experiments and we quantify how single cell rates change in going from a resting state to a running or a high arousal state, um, then we again observed mixed responses where some cells are significantly excited by running, but still a substantial fraction are significantly inhibited. So this suggests that this delta variance modulation, at least in the context of this model, is more consistent with the observed changes in spontaneous firing rates in the data. So we next examined how this uh, delta variance or arousal modulation affects the ability um, to distinguish different stimuli in the model to compare with the data. Um, and so in order to do that, we model sensory stimuli as additional external inputs that selectively target uh, different subgroups of stimulus selective cells. And in the clustered network model, those subgroups will be defined by the assembly structure. So given this setup, we can then analyze how population decoding performance varies as a function of this delta variance modulation. So first we can consider the unstructured networks. And here in the bottom plot, um, we can summarize the decoding results by plotting the peak accuracy versus this delta variance modulation, um, delta S. And what we see here is that for the unstructured networks, decoding performance or the ability to distinguish different stimuli monotonically decreases as a function of this modulation. On the other hand, if we perform this same analysis, but on the clustered networks, then the result is very different. So in this case, uh, the decoding performance first increases to a maximum and then decreases as a function of this delta variance perturbation. Um, so this means that there's um, a a certain value of this modulation for which decoding performance or stimulus discriminability is optimal. So given these results, we conclude that only the model with clustered architecture in this setup is consistent with the inverted U relationship between frequency discriminability and arousal level that's observed in the data. So we'd next like to try and develop uh, maybe a little more intuition for the non-monotonic behavior of the decoding performance. Um, and so to that end, we can perform a mean field analysis on a simplified network of just two excitatory clusters and one background inhibitory population. Um, and so if you follow the standard formalism, then you can determine the population rates through a self-consistent relation where the mean and the variance of the input to a given population can have contributions from the recurrent connectivity as well as potentially from the external arousal modulation that we introduce. 
And then using an approach that was first described by Mascaro and Amit, it's possible to go just a step further and reduce our system here to an effective theory just describing the behavior of the two clusters, um, which is what we're really interested in understanding. And if you use this formalism, then you can calculate an effective potential energy for this system of integrate and fire neurons. Um, and when you do this, as you would expect, there are two potential wells um, corresponding to the network's attractors, where either E1 is on and E2 is off, um, or vice versa. And these wells are uh, separated by a barrier of some height h that will control the rate of transitions between these attractors. So first we'd like to use this theory to calculate how this delta variance modulation affects the network's attractors. And what we find is that if you increase this modulation a little bit from baseline, then the first thing that happens is the barrier height decreases, and this leads to a speeding up of the network dynamics. But if you continue to increase the strength of this modulation, then this theory predicts that there's a transition from a two attractor phase to a single attractor phase where you've lost the metastable dynamics. So we can now try to use this intuition from the effective theory to understand the decoding results in the full network. So first, we know that stimulus discriminability in the network should be best when the set of stimulus selective clusters can be consistently activated or pushed into the high activity state after stimulus onset, and when the non-selective clusters can be consistently deactivated and go into a low activity state. So with that in mind, um, first we can consider the case of a small uh, external modulation, uh, which we're saying would correspond to the low arousal state. Um, and we can look at what happens. So in this case, the intuition is that the clusters are very stiff, so the switching is slow. And so it's going to be difficult to push the system from an initial state that does not robustly code for the stimulus into a new state where um, the specific set of stimulus selective clusters, the ones that code for the identity of the stimulus, are, are consistently activated. And that, in turn, results in poor coding. Um, when we increase the delta variance modulation to an intermediate level, you can see that there's still a clear distinction between active and inactive clusters, um, but the, the switching between these activations and, and inactivations uh, becomes faster. So here the intuition is that the clusters are more flexible, and it's thus easier for a stimulus to turn on or activate the specific set of clusters that code for that stimulus, um, and that results in an improvement in coding. And then finally, in the case of a very strong delta variance modulation or high arousal, we lose the fact that we have clusters at all. So in this scenario, there's no longer going to be as strong of a distinction between the firing rates of neurons that are not activated by the stimulus versus those that are, and the loss of that contrast uh, will in turn hinder the ability to differentiate between stimuli, which will result in worse decoding performance. So in summary, um, in this study, we looked at electrophysiological experiments from mouse auditory cortex, and our preliminary results indicate that discriminability of tone frequency um, seems to be best at intermediate levels of arousal. And to explain this finding, we considered a spiking model of a cortical circuit in which arousal was modeled as an increase in the spatial variance of external inputs. And using this model, we found that arousal-dependent coding could be explained by modulations in metastable dynamics. And we tried to show that optimal coding in the model occurs in a regime where these metastable dynamics clearly exist, but when they're flexible enough to be consistently modulated by a stimulus. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to mention that going forward, one direction we're really interested um, in pursuing is looking at this question um, of state-dependent sound processing in the context of freely moving animals. So this is a sped up video um, from Mike Weir's lab at Oregon where they're starting to do this. So you can see an animal, uh, video's maybe slowing down a little bit, but an animal moving around um, in its home environment while the experimentalists um, record its pupil diameter and neural activity. Um, so with that, I'd just like to thank Luca for letting me work on these ideas for all of his detailed guidance. Um, I'd also like to thank Mike Weir for providing us all the experimental data um, and also all the members of the Mazzucato Lab and um, the whole Institute of Neuroscience. Thank you so much. <laughs>
thank you for that really interesting talk. And uh, we have time for some questions. Over there. Yeah. I wanted to ask, how do you interpret the cluster activity here um, when there is no stimulus? Or in other words, why do we not constantly perceive some sound in your model? Sorry, can you say that again? Oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, how do you interpret the cluster activity, which is always ongoing and switching in your model, or in other words, why do we not always have the impression that we hear some sound? Yeah, so I guess in this case, we would just assume that even at baseline, there's some metastable activity. So it's there even without a sound. And then when you introduce the sound, the idea is that it just, it, it, targets a certain set of clusters, and then those are the ones that preferentially want to become active. But you can only turn them on um, if, if you can modulate the attractor dynamics, either with a very strong stimulus or in a regime where the cluster dynamics are more flexible. Is there one more question? Yeah, thanks for the talk, really enjoyed it. Um, how do you think the structure of this uh, U arousal state would change in an anxiety disorders? And would you, would you be able to tweak your model to, to go in that direction? And like in the U shift, would it shift, uh, squish, scale, how do you, yeah. Yeah, that's, um, that's really interesting, I guess. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't specifically thought about that, but um, I guess it would move so that you're, you're, less, you're less likely to be in the drowsy and disengaged state, and maybe it would be more of a monotonic decrease, perhaps. Um, so maybe, yeah, we'd have to think about how you would change things in order to get that. But yes, cool, thanks. good question. All right, I think we're uh, approaching our dinner break here. Um, there are some questions in the app, so hopefully uh, our speaker will be able to, to ask the, answer those questions a little later. Um, one final announcement is that the Professional Development Panel uh, and Social uh, Pathways to Research Beyond Academia will be held in this room at, uh, starting at 7 o'clock. And finally, can we thank all of the speakers in our session today? Thank you. Thank you.
Hello. For those of you guys that are coming in for the professional development panel, if you could just move a little bit closer. I mean, I know the social distancing thing is going on, but just move a little bit closer so that um, we can make this a little bit more informal and it's more easier for you guys to ask questions of the panel and stuff. So come on closer, a little closer. Okay, a lot closer. <laughs> 